That's true. <laughs> now it's working, I guess. Can you check? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I thought you guys set it up already. <laughs> yeah, video is not there. Now it's there. Now I can see it over there. But yeah, mic was not working for sure. I don't know why. Yeah, it, it was off. It was on actually for a while and then it turned off, turned off or something. Okay. Okay, that's good. Yeah, well, well, they missed the first part. That's fine. <laughs> we have another recording of it, right? So hopefully. So Zoom was okay or? Okay, okay. <laughs> it was not okay earlier. Yeah, you should have told me earlier. Okay. Okay, uh, but basically, I think this, uh, my point, uh, I would like to mention that the micro benchmark is also really important in validating your simulator. This is something we did not talk about yesterday. We told we focused on workloads, but running micro benchmarks enables you to debug your simulator because with micro benchmarks, you know what workload you, uh, what uh, behavior you would expect. And that's a good way of debugging. With a whole workload, it's very hard to debug uh, things. Okay. Uh, and then you can you can run whole workloads, and that's one of the uh, benefits of Ramulator. Uh, you can see that uh, you can compare many different standards, uh, and that's what we, we wanted to really enable, and we wanted to showcase that you could actually compare many different standards. Uh, and here you can see uh, we ran, uh, I think, 22 workloads uh, using a simple CPU model. There are different CPU models that you can attach. And you can see how different uh, DRAM standards perform uh, across those workloads. For example, DDR4 is slightly better than DDR3 in this particular case. Uh, sub sub level parallelism is slightly better than DDR4. LPDDR workloads are not as good as DDR3, but they're not too bad also. And you can see that there's a range uh, different workloads behave. And high bandwidth memory is, uh, I guess, even better than sub level parallelism, as you can see over here. But there are some workloads that benefit a lot from high bandwidth memory also, as you can see. So you can do this sort of studies, and this is exactly what you wanted to enable. And a flex flexible simulator enables uh, this sort of study. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's good to have flexible simulators, but this is also uh, quite cycle accurate because it's really focusing on the DRAM system. So we're not missing uh, uh, cycles in the DRAM system, but there are some things that are not modeled uh, also. You can figure out what's not modeled uh, by looking at the uh, source code. I think you will you will uh, work on this in a future lab. And the, uh, this is free and open source. So you can find it online. Uh, and people have actually used it for many th different things. And I will also mention that you can integrate simulators. Uh, so uh, Ramulator, for example, provides multiple modes. You can actually drive it just with memory traces without having a CPU model. You just feed memory traces and see request throughput, for example. Or you can drive it with a very simple CPU model uh, that is throttling, meaning it, 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 it basically models the, uh, the instructions. And then if you actually have lots of cache misses outstanding, at some point you stall or if you have some number of cache models outstanding, you stall. So you can build a C simple CPU model, or you could actually couple it with a full system simulator, uh, in this particular case, Gem5. And the full system simulator can be, the, uh, can be uh, essentially attached to uh, your main memory using Ramulator. And then you, you can model the full system effects and the, and the effects that uh, different uh, types of memory, for example, has uh, on workloads and the full system. So basically, there, there are a lot of possibilities over here. That's the good part. And if you actually have a nice interface to your simulator, you can actually try to couple it with other simulators also. Does that make sense? OK. And then reproducibility is also important. Uh, I think it's important to actually enable reproducibility by clearly uh, showing how you can reproduce the results in any paper. This is what we should strive for in general, I think. Uh, Okay, so if you're interested more in Ramulator, you're going to read the paper if you well, if you want to get the bonus points or if you're just interested. But there's also a Ramulator project course, as I mentioned in the past, uh, that covers that goes a lot more into detail uh, on Ramulator. Okay, this is the bonus assignment basically, and it's a short paper. So we've seen some example studies using Ramulator. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but we've discussed actually an even more sophisticated study that looks at complex workload and DM interactions. I'm not going to talk much about it. But this, uh, it's really simulation that enables the study, right? When we discussed the study, we said that you cannot do this on a real system because uh, basically, if you want to compare, let's say, nine different DRAM standards, 
there's no real system that supports nine different DM standards. Uh, there's no real system that supports more than two different DM standards, actually. Usually, it's only one DM standard that they support. And we know the reasons for this, right? You have to build different memory controls and different analog interfaces for each standard. So it doesn't make sense to actually build a, DM, a, a real chip that supports many DM standards. So the only way to do this is in simulation, basically. Uh, it's very interesting, actually, when we submitted this paper to a conference, uh, one of the reviewers, actually multiple of the reviewers, probably commented that, why don't you do this uh, study on a real system? This shows how clueless reviewers can be, I guess. <laughs> because let us know which real system to use, and we'd love to do this study on a real system, right? But that system doesn't exist. Even if you want to compare, let's say, DDR3 and DDR4, you have to buy different CPUs, actually. And you can, how do you compare apples and oranges? Right? There's no way. The goal here was to actually fix the CPU and look at the workloads, run the, fix the workloads, and look at the effect of different standards and different uh, DM design choices have uh, essentially on the workload performance and energy. Yeah, so it's good to also think about, uh, uh, like when you're a reviewer, it's also good to think about like what exists. Okay, I would love to do the study on a real system also, right? But if it doesn't exist, I cannot do it. And I'm not going to build this real system and nobody's going to build this real system. I can guarantee that uh, because of the analog interface problem, right? Okay, uh, yeah, and you can see that. And we've discussed this also. This, this, uh, this is one of the studies that show that latency uh, is a big problem and standards are not improving the latency that much. In fact, in some cases, they're actually worsening the latency to improve bandwidth. As a result, some workloads actually lose performance significantly, as we have discussed earlier also. And these were the key takeaways. I'm not going to go through them again. But basically, uh, this, is what, uh, this is one of the things that simulation enables. You cannot do this on a real system. But with a simulator, you can relatively easily explore uh, the system. Uh, and of course, validation is always an issue, right? How uh, will a real system actually show these results? Uh, it's very hard to know in the end. Uh, I believe it will, uh, because the simulator is actually very heavily validated. You can actually see it. But then you cannot uh, ever validate it on a, a real system. Uh, uh, we could have potentially individually validate on uh, a bunch of real systems, but that's also very difficult to do, actually, uh, because uh, some of these systems you do not have access to uh, as well. Okay, it's good to think about that. <laughs> so basically, as an architect, you don't always have uh, the luxury of also completely validating your simulator. Uh, that's why I think this becomes an art at some point, uh, because uh, like if without, without, without complete validation, uh, what are you going to do, right? It's not a perfect science in that case. But this is true, I think, in many, many cases where you build something uh, that you cannot completely validate. In general, systems building, uh, architecture. Uh, these are areas where you cannot completely validate things, uh, even though you would like to, right? There's just no way. Okay, I mean, we talked about Blockhammer also. There's another example with uh, RAM later, and this source code is released. You can also find it online. And there's another uh, case where uh, you can actually model a lot of different Rowhammer solutions, for example, that have happened until Blockhammer. So a bunch of new Rowhammer solutions that have come up after block hammer, but that's not included in the source code clearly. But this is still a good place to start uh, doing research on row hammer solutions uh, if people are interested. There are many other ideas evaluated with emulator. We've discussed some of them, like low cost in interlink subarrays. That's also evaluated with emulator. Uh, it's actually, you can extend emulator to do all of these things that we have discussed uh, connections between subarrays, data movement between subarrays, NDM caching, fast pre charge. You can basically uh, model. Uh, uh, what, uh, what your proposal is and get uh, results uh, like this, right? Speed up, energy, et cetera. I should also mention that uh, Reamulator also provides support for energy modeling uh, by coupling it with some energy model uh, that people have proposed and we have also developed uh, later on. Uh, but So basically, you can also do energy and performance modeling at the same time. I think other people are extending for reliability modeling also, but uh, I'll not talk about that. Any questions? So you will get to use this, hopefully, in addition to the other simulators that you're using. So there's also an emulator for processing in memory. We extended this for processing in memory. Uh, it's explained in this paper and it's released. You can also find it. People are also using it. And it's also discussed in this project course. Very briefly, I will talk about uh, other simulators. Clearly, there's a lot that exists. Uh, some of these are used uh, or uh, 
useful for different purposes. So Gem5, I mentioned earlier, this is actually used a lot in the architecture community. It's a full system multi-core simulator. Uh, it's pretty sophisticated, I should say. It's not easy to get into. So it's not easy to modify uh, also. It's both functional and timing. Uh, uh, for SSD simulation, I mentioned in an earlier uh, lecture that MQSIM is something that we have developed, especially for new uh, modern SSDs. Uh, in hard disk simulation, there's disk sim. So there's clearly a lot of, uh, you can simulate a lot of the part of the system. But this doesn't even include networking simulators. There are a bunch of networking simulators also. Uh, and then uh, processing near memory, you've seen demo sim in the past. There are other sim uh, simulators that are developed uh, uh, that uh, provide some trade-off compared to, for example, Gem5. Sni Sniper is used for fast processor simulation. Uh, this actually raises the abstraction level a little bit. Uh, it uses intervals to simulate uh, as opposed to every single instruction, let's say. So it's actually a lot easier to modify in many ways uh, compared to Gem5. So it's a lot easier to explore the design space uh, with a simulator like Sniper compared to Gem5. Uh, Scarab is another simulator that uh, we developed together with Intel and released it recently, well, recently meaning two years ago or so, uh, for microarchitectural simulation. So this actually models the microarchitecture of a single core quite uh, well compared to Sniper as well as compared to Gem5. Uh, it's easier to modify, but it's not full system. So you can see that there are different simulators that provide different trade-offs. And then there are other simulators that are used in uh, for, for purely functional simulator. You can certainly extend it with timing also, but these are some simulators that are used for functional modeling, functional simulation, et cetera. And certainly you can develop your own simulator for your own purpose. And this is actually a good thing to do uh, in general uh, if you want to get to... Uh, uh, then, uh, if you really want to be a good architect, at some point, I think you should develop your own simulator, but because it really helps uh, you really under, uh, helps you to understand things uh, much better. Of course, it takes time, but of course, if you don't need to develop your simulator, it's, uh, it's good to start with some other simulator and understand it. The problem is, I think people sometimes use, as we discussed last time, also people sometimes use these simulators as black box things, uh, pretending that they don't need to understand. Uh, especially the important things that are uh, related to the ideas they're studying. As a result, they make a lot of mistakes potentially because if you don't understand what's going on underneath, how can you be sure that your modeling is really correct? You're basically trusting the simulator, but maybe your idea is changing the simulator in such a way, even if the, uh, even if the simulator is perfectly trustworthy, which is questionable to begin with, if, you're, if your idea is changing in such a way that it makes it less trustworthy, then using it in a black box doesn't make sense, right? We discussed this yesterday with Simple Scalar, for example, right? If you're changing the memory systems, uh, if, you're, if your idea is dependent on, for example, uh, banks being modeled in the memory system, and if your simulator is not modeling the banks, if you're not aware of it, then you have a big problem, right? You basically produce potentially garbage results and garbage ideas uh, in the end. If you, if you produce garbage results, it's better, maybe. Maybe your idea is still valid, but you don't know it's valid. But you may produce results that... Uh, claim that your idea is valid, but your idea may, be, may not be valid, right? So basically, you, have, uh, you really need to know what you're doing, uh, even if you're using a simulator out of the box. Okay, this is the move. Uh, this, this was discussed uh, earlier. This is also open source, and people are using it as well. Uh, and I think Quan uh, mm, talked about this uh, earlier, and there's a PIM course that also covers a bunch of these simulators. This is MQSIM. It's a, a SSD simulator, and uh, Rakesh, uh, talks about this in the uh, SSD course, right? Rakesh and Mohammed. There are many more simulators. I mean, some of these are released by us, but there are many, many others clearly, but you can find a bunch of other simulators here uh, on our website. Any questions? Yes, please. Okay, that's a great question. Basically, uh, I mean, there are multiple approaches. In architectural simulators, uh, usually uh, the approach that's taken is uh, you count events. Uh, these are, you can think of these as events that consume some energy, and each event uh, has a, a energy consumption associated with it based on the technology uh, that you plan to, let's say, implement uh, the pro whatever you're uh, planning to implement uh, on. For example, a cache ac an L1 cache access may have some energy value, an L2 cache access may have some energy value, and uh, add operation may have some energy value. So, you have a bunch of events, and uh, you get their counts when you simulate the workload, and then you multiply uh, the event count with the energy associated with the event, and you sum everything up. So that's one sort of simple energy model. Does that make sense? 
Yes, exactly. So this is dynamic energy. So uh, with leakage energy, it's usually a function of uh, the structure uh, and the time, right? So you have some assuming some constant leakage and also temperature. So there are people actually develop models to make it also uh, more sophisticated. But leakage energy is modeled as a function of time and the structure. Uh, so you can also multiply it. But then uh, uh, if you want to be more sophisticated, you can take into account temperature. And that changes leakage and also dynamic power. So you can actually make these models more sophisticated. But then you need temperature modeling as well. And people have developed those temperature modeling simulators as well in the architecture community. Now, they become even harder to ver verify, of course, right, and validate. Yes? Yeah, I didn't tell you where you get it, but, so, but you need to get that somehow, right? So how do you get it? Uh, normally, one way to get it, for example, you, you develop an, uh, you, one, one way to get it is because you, you know that from a past processor, for example, right? You, you've implemented it and you figured out the energy consumption uh, and using, uh, you can use old values. Now, is that a good thing? Not necessarily because you're gonna implement five years down into the future. Maybe you scale those values using some technology scaling trends that you may see. And people have actually done all of these in architecture uh, uh, simulation. Yeah, that's usually how you get it, actually. Or you model, you have a circuit simulator uh, that actually models the energy also. That's another possibility. And circuit simulators have a similar problem. How do you get the model? They usually rely on past numbers and do some scaling into the future. Yeah. A lot of things become easier if you actually have access to energy numbers from the past of different operations. So this is where actually... Uh, a company that's doing the right thing has a lot of advantage because they've developed a lot of different processors they, uh, and different technology nodes. So they can actually guess what, they, what, the, what might be coming. And they know the internal architecture of different uh, adders, multipliers, or whatever it's, uh, you're, you're looking for, uh, you could, you're looking uh, to find the energy of. So you can actually do a lot of guessing, let's say. Modeling is essentially guessing, right? A, a more, let's say, scientific way of <laughs> guessing. <laughs> That's a very good question, though. But these are even harder. I mean, performance is a bit easier. Energy becomes even harder. Temperature becomes even harder. Uh, yeah. I mean, people even model the voltage, uh, like droops that you may have uh, uh, when you actually, uh, uh, for example, when you, when you start a big unit, uh, you, have a, uh, you pull current uh, from uh, your current source, and clearly you get voltage droops, and that may actually affect your reliability, and people have developed simulators for modeling those things as well. So validation is always a problem. <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts? Okay. So uh, what time is it? <laughs> I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but this is, uh, once you love simulation, you can do simulation in other uh, domains also. This is something that we had worked on uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and we wanted to model COVID-19 COVID uh, modeling and prediction. And this is a paper, and you can download all the source code and do your studies. I'm not going to go into the details of how you model it. It's not that hard, uh, really. But essentially, uh, people have used analytical modeling and simulation uh, for COVID modeling. Uh, actually, some people have used neural networks to model and showed good results. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if they're really good at this point. But uh, basically, the, the, the goal is to predict, uh, uh, yeah, essentially predict, uh, let's say, uh, the next wave and how bad the wave will be, and assuming some mitigation measures and assuming some variant modeling. So you can actually model a lot of these things. Uh, you start with some uh, R number, which is the reproduction number of the uh, virus. And then basically you model how people get infected. You can actually figure out some, you can actually model the traveling, et cetera. You can actually model uh, the variance with some randomization uh, and the number of infections, et cetera. So you can actually, uh, you can find the code and you can look at this. But basically, our goal was to develop an accurate simulation model, not analytical model or a neural network-based prediction model based on past information, uh, but a simulation model that tries to simulate these effects and see what happens, basically, with different mitigation measures. And uh, in this case, we actually also took into account uh, seasonality, uh, which uh, there's, a, there's a big correlation between temperature and uh, infections, essentially. We take into account that also. But I will not go into details. Uh, so we can find uh, some other models that we compared to in the paper. 
but you can actually do a lot of uh, interesting things, basically. This is uh, essentially the model. Uh, well, uh, observed case is the red one, and estimated case is what we uh, expect based on a uh, different number of uh, different kinds of measures, et cetera. Uh, and you can see that uh, we're tracking the curve nicely. And it has predictive power also. Uh, for example, you can, you can find this online also. Uh, basically, uh, we were able to predict a bunch of waves. For example, here we say COVID underestimates that we are experiencing a deadly new wave that will peak on the last week of January 2022, which is very similar in numbers to the way we had blah, blah. And that was actually correct, basically. So you can see that this was the prediction that we had. This was the reality. And our suggestion was basically to increase the strength of the measures to actually overcome. Clearly, that was not implemented. Uh, but uh, the reality essentially validated what we predicted. So that's the interesting part. You can actually predict these things, basically. And this, is, this prediction is, is, is on the website, so you can find it. And uh, yeah. So basically, I think uh, this is a general thing. With simulation, you can do a lot of fascinating things, I think. Uh, here, we're trying to actually... Uh, here, we're, we have actually multiple goals, right? With this COVID modeling is we're, we're, we're also... We're trying to match the behaviors on an existing system in the past so that we can validate the simulator. So with past data... You can validate the simulator. And as you get more and more data, you can validate the simulator more so that your pre future predictions are more accurate. So we, did, we used a lot of the past data to validate the simulator so that you can actually predict more, more, more and more accurately. But I think the goal, the, also, the goal also is to explore design space relatively quickly with different sort of mitigation measures. So with different sort of mitigation measures, if you can model them accurately in your simulator, you can also see where the curve will go, right? If you take, uh, I don't have it over here, but well, yeah, we had a bunch of curves that is predicting. This is, if you don't change the mitigation measure, well, this is reality, sorry. If you don't change the mitigation measure, basically you get something like this. If you change the mitigation measure, you see that this peak actually reduces significantly. If you actually relax the mitigation measure, the peak actually increases significantly. And we actually say this some, uh, uh, something like this. Relaxing the mitigation measure should not be an option. Uh, basically, the policymakers have only one choice, that is increasing the strength of the currently applied mitigation measures for 30 days. Relaxing the mitigation measure should not be an option before at least February 2022, as it would increase exponentially the number of cases, hospitalization, and deaths by 5.5x. So basically, that's the expectation. So they did not relax it, but they didn't increase it also. So what, what was expected, what was predicted by the simulator happened, essentially, in uh, January 2022. And this was the peak of the Omicron uh, curve, if you remember, actually. People are having a hard time to remember because of long COVID also these days, but <laughs> that happens. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so I think this is another example of uh, uh, you need to predict the future and your decision, uh, the effectiveness of your decision in the future, and you don't know clearly uh, all the variables, but this is where modeling and simulation can help. And I believe actually, it is actually uh, simulation is very uh, important here because uh, it model. Uh, so there were, as I said, there were neural network based models that were developed based on the data that you've seen in the past. And some uh, people develop a neural network to predict number of cases that you will get in the future. Uh, and they showed some success. Uh, it's very hard to really adapt that to predict new variants, for example, where simulation really helps uh, prediction of new variants because based on uh, the knowledge that you have on mutations and the probability of mutations as a function of how infectious the virus is, as well as how many people are infected, you can actually potentially guess uh, the new variants also. With a neural network-based model, I think it's very tough. Uh, so this, this also uh, goes into another idea, right? Why are architects using simulation and not neural networks? That's an area that could be potentially examined, right? Can you actually use neural networks to predict uh, the performance of a workload and a change that you make? Uh, basically, a neural network-based uh, performance prediction model. And maybe neural networks is too specific, but a machine learning-based performance prediction model. Could that be interesting? That could be potentially, I don't know. That's something that, could, that should be explored, I think. I don't want to dismiss that immediately, but there are some limitations to that sort of modeling also. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to skip these because I already said uh, all of these. This is just, these are just reminders. And that's the end of the simulation lecture. Any other questions? Thoughts? Okay, if not, then we should move directly to the next lecture on this. Yeah, we should probably, unless you want to take a break early today. Thoughts? Who wants to take a break? 
pretty early. Who doesn't want to take a break? Okay, we should go then. It's too early. <laughs> okay, let's move. There's stuff in chat. Are there questions? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are. So how do I do this? Stop share. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. Okay. So now we will start emerging memory technologies. This is a perfect case study where simulation can also help a lot, right? You have this emerging memory technology that people not even have implemented uh, yet. And they may not even impl implement five years down the road, 10 years down the road. How are we going to study its potential effects uh, on future workloads or even current workloads? Uh, this is actually really important to do, I think, so that you can forecast and enable emerging memory technologies going into the future uh, or emerging any technology into the future. Uh, because you don't want to wait for that to be implemented, uh, because clearly that has a lot of cost implications. And even if it's implemented today, it may not be implemented as large scale where you can actually do some really interesting studies, right? For example, uh, you may have an emerging memory technology chip uh, that is only four kilobits. Sometimes it's only uh, one bit, right? Device people actually uh, figure out how to uh, implement one bit, but they don't scale it to very large structures because they have to test that one bit first. Uh, basically, whatever is already out there may not be possible to experiment with. So this is where simulation comes in extremely handy so that you can do forecasting of what uh, could be useful. And this also is very useful because if you do system level studies with simulation that shows that some characteristics uh, need to change, uh, people can potentially try to develop the technology that has better characteristics. So there's actually a potential for driving the design of emerging memory technologies. And that's to a limited extent happens also. But let's talk about, yes. The screen is not shared? What do you mean? Okay, I thought you shared it. Uh, yeah, today we're having a lot of problems. This one? Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, is the screen now shared? Please check, double check. I don't see it here. Okay, it looks better here. Okay, so where were we? Uh, yeah, uh, essentially, uh, simulations, again, are really important for emerging memory technologies. But let's talk about main memory as emerging technologies. Uh, basically, we've studied DRAM a lot. Uh, DRAM is charge-based memory. You've seen this before. Uh, essentially, you store uh, data in terms of capacitor charge, and you have transistor leakage. Uh, floating, uh, not floating, uh, flash uh, memory is uh, similar in the sense that it also stores charge. And based on the trapped amount of charge, uh, you, you, you represent the data value. So in flash, uh, the charge is stored in the floating gate in a structure that looks like this. And in DRAM, it's in a capacitor. Uh, this floating gate tends to be a lot uh, more resilient, let's say, to charge leakage. As a result, this is non-volatile, but we've discussed that. Uh, it's non-volatile to a limited extent, uh, right? If you actually uh, cause a lot of, uh, do a lot of writing, uh, the, uh, the electrons start escaping or finding ways of more easily escaping uh, through the, uh, through the, uh, out of the floating gate. As a result, you'll, you'll need to start refreshing the flash memory uh, much more frequently, uh, especially when you have written to it a lot. And this happens in data centers today, basically. Uh, you refresh, actually, flash memory toward the end of its lifetime a lot more, uh, whereas you don't refresh it at the beginning when you buy it. Uh, okay, but basically, these two memories operate based on charge, so they rely on charge placement and control. And we've seen many issues with DRAM, right? And we've also discussed briefly issues with flash memory. Essentially, it's difficult to place and control charge, especially when the charge storage unit size reduces. So this floating gate becomes smaller, this capacitor becomes smaller. 
charge starts escaping much more easily. Uh, and there it becomes much more vulnerable to noise. So that's the problem with these technologies. Reliable sensing is very difficult. Uh, and that's why we're having issues like rope hammer, refresh, and a lot of other issues in uh, flash memory. And flash memory, essentially what happened was in planar flash memory, two-dimensional flash memory, uh, uh, we had a lot of scaling issues uh, in, uh, until uh, 2016 or so, uh, because uh, uh, the, the gate was becoming very, very small. And as a result, very small amount of charge was being stored. Uh, so what happened was uh, innovation in the technology level. So uh, flash memory manufacturers figured out uh, how to stack these floating gates in a three-dimensional manner. So what they did was they basically uh, uh, had a, a three-dimensional string uh, where you would put uh, a bunch of these flash cells. And that enabled them to actually increase the size of the flash cell. So uh, the, uh, the way they used to increase density uh, increased capacity and reduced cost was to reduce the size of the flowing gate. But in 2016 or so, they figured out, okay, we could actually stack these cells and then increase the size of the cell and gain, still gain density by adding more layers, like three-dimensional layers. So that's another way of scaling. So 3D stacking enables you to actually scale the memory technology, memory density, without requiring to reduce the cell size. So this gave some breathing room to the technology and this 3D uh, stacked or 3D NAND uh, or vertical NAND as it's known today is what's employed in uh, state-of-the-art flash devices. And that, that alleviated some of the scaling issues because the cell became larger, but you still were able to gain density. Now, the problem is, of course, uh, will this go forever? Not clear because it's not clear how many things you can stack reliably uh, without running into a lot of thermal issues, et cetera. Uh, so people, uh, people are now also reducing the size of the floating gate as well as adding more stacks. So at some point, we're going to hit the scaling problem again, basically. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh Yeah, that's right. But people have figured out a relatively low cost ways of manufacturing that 3D stacking. <laughs> that's a good question. I didn't look at the prices. I mean, it, it, it probably had an impact on the cost, but I don't know how much. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, I mean, you need to certainly invest uh, in uh, the infrastructure. No question about that. But 3D stacking infrastructure already exists. Uh, and this is uh, stacking uh, uh, essentially the same type of cell, right? You're not doing any mixed stacking. It's not logic and memory. It's just uh, the same NAND string. But maybe Rakesh has an idea on the, in terms of the cost. Has the cost increased significantly with 3D NAND? I don't think so, right? So there's certainly time that uh, you require uh, to uh, get the manufacturing cost to a nice level also. <laughs> yeah. That has happened concurrently while uh, things were developing for 2D stacking, basically. No question about that. Yes, 3D stacking is harder. OK. OK, so we've discussed some solutions to this. I'm not going to talk about these again, but we've discussed a lot of solutions to uh, the scaling problems. Uh, and you can read this, but. We've talked about memory-centric system design, new memory architectures, better waste management in terms of latency, for example. Well, we didn't completely talk about all kinds of better waste management, but you can do compression to reduce the overheads uh, of uh, having large memories uh, and wasted memories. Uh, we discussed reliability issues. We've discussed latency issues. We've discussed energy issues somewhat. But energy, especially in terms of data movement, we've discussed that, right? Uh, we've talked about improving bandwidth. We've talked about reducing especially latency waste. But as I said, compression can reduce capacity waste uh, and better bandwidth utilization can reduce bandwidth waste. And then we talked about enabling computation close to data. So all of these ideas are applicable to any technology, actually, uh, as we discussed also. And we've covered some of these papers. These are a bunch of papers that we've been working on. It's not a complete list on this topic. 
Now we're going to talk about emerging memory technologies. I think this is a different direction. Uh, everything we discuss is applicable over here also. Of course, you need to, again, take into account the technology. Uh, but what's interesting with these technologies is there are some emerging memory technologies uh, that are resistive. Uh, they are more scalable than DRAM, uh, and they are also non-volatile. Uh, one example is phase change memory. This is actually an old technology. It was developed in 1960s, uh, and it works in a completely different way than a DRAM cell. You have some material called phase change material. It could be multiple different types. Uh, chalcogonite glass is one example. You'll see in a later slide different potential materials. Uh, but this uh, material exists in two states, uh, amorphous or uh, crystalline. Uh, and essentially, you can represent data based on the state the material exists in, zero or one, right? And then you can also have intermediate states, as we will discuss in a little bit. Uh, and data is read by detecting the material's resistance somehow. And this turns out to be a much more scalable process than detecting charge, because the charge storage unit, char charge is very small, whereas the resistance range, if the resistance range is very large, you can detect uh, the state much more easily, essentially. That's the key idea over here. So as I said, this was developed in 1960s, uh, and it's actually used in rewritable CDs, for example. Uh, it's used in rewritable CDs because uh, the, the two states of the material have different optical reflexivities. So you can actually do optical reading on this based on uh, shine light on it and see uh, how it reflects light. And if it reflects light in one way versus the other, you can say it's, uh, it stores a zero or one, right? But of course, it's a very slow reading process, clearly. So more recently, people have developed uh, read devices or reading circuitry, let's say, sense amplification circuitry. You can think of it that way. Uh, that essentially reads phase change memory relatively fast, especially IBM uh, did a lot of work on this. Intel did a lot of work on this and also some other companies. And you can actually read this nice paper by IBM uh, that describes uh, the technology in 2008, as you can see over here. Uh, it was prototyped at 20 nanometers long before the feature size of 20 nanometers, long before DRAM reached 20 nanometers, uh, which happened around 2000, I don't know, maybe 15 or so in DRAM. And DRAM had a lot of problems when reaching 20 nanometers. But this was a prototype, so this one had a big chip, basically. It was uh, small uh, cells. And it's expected to scale to much lower nanometers because of the way you read uh, and write and you store the data and the resistance range. And it's also expected to be denser than DRAM for another reason, because you can actually store multiple bit per, bits per cell, as we will see. You can represent the resistance range as levels, as opposed, as opposed to just two levels, zero and one, you can divide the resistance range into multiple levels and store four bits, uh, two bits, three bits, or four bits, right? We will see that also, just like in flash. In, in the flash memory, you represent the voltage range uh, in terms of multiple levels. Uh, but of course, whenever you go to multiple levels, uh, the, the noise uh, between different levels need to be taken into account. Now, this is one technology. We'll see some other technologies uh, more briefly than phase change memory. Uh, and then we will talk about the emerging memory technology in general. Uh, the upside of this technology clearly is it's more scalable, right? The downside is there are many other shortcomings, as we will see. The key question is, can we somehow enable uh, these technologies to replace DRAM, if possible? That's a tough task, as we have discussed in the past. Or augment DRAM if we cannot completely replace it. And maybe even surpass, surpass DRAM under some conditions. And we will see all of these, I think, or, or trials for all of these, let's say. And we're going to cover some of these works that we have been doing and others have been doing also. So the interesting news is this Intel introduced uh, the Optane uh, persistent memory. This is uh, based on 3D X point, according to them. But it's, all evidence indicates that this is actually a phase change memory based uh, technology. And you could actually buy these. I don't know if you can still buy these because Intel decided to get out of this business, <laughs> according to them. Uh, we'll see because this is actually a very heavy uh, manufacturing business. Uh, so. The fact that they decide to get out of the business doesn't mean that it's necessarily a bad idea. It, might, it may be bad for their business to continue uh, sinking money into a costly manufacturing, uh, let's say, uh, endeavor, right? But basically, you could buy these. I believe you can still buy these. I don't know how long you will still buy these, but you could, you could actually use this in your DIMM slot as your main memory. Now, it does a lot more than DM, as we will see, because there are a lot of down, downsides over here. And I'm going to talk about this paper, but this is a paper that uh, we have... Uh, written while I was at Microsoft Research over the course of two years, we were examining what could be a better alternative to DRAM and phase change memory was very interesting for us. Uh, and this paper uh, kind of shows that it's very interesting, but there are a lot of challenges uh, to replace DRAM, as you will see. 
and this is another paper that uh, is uh, building on that. Let's talk about charge versus resistive memories a little bit. Uh, so as we discussed, charge memory is DRAM and flash. These are the dominant technologies today. Uh, you write data by capturing charge and you read data by detecting voltage. In resistive memories, uh, PCM, STTMRAM, resistors, RRAM, you write data by pulsing some current and read data by detecting the resistance. And there are various ways of detecting the resistance. I'm going to show you one way, but there are many possible ways of detecting resistance, as we will see. There are a bunch of promising resistive memory technologies. It's not an exhaustive list. Uh, PCM, uh, you inject current to change the material phase. Uh, and then resistance is determined by the phase of the material. STTMRAM is a magnetic technology. You inject current to change the polarity of a magnet, very small micromagnet or nanomagnet, whatever you would like to call it. And the resistance is determined by the polarity of the magnets. And we will talk about that a little bit also. I will not talk a whole lot about memristors, RM, uh, RRAM, uh, but they're essentially based on uh, the high level. The abstract level is very similar, uh, but the underlying working is different. You inject current to change the atomic structure of some material and the resistance is determined by atom distance. So you can see that the way these work is different and the way you need to read uh, each of these cells, uh, different cells is different. So read devices need to be different and things need to be manufactured uh, nicely, let's say. Okay, so STTMRAM is actually, uh, it's, it's manufacturing is compatible with CMOS. So this, this potentially could be a, a, a a, a, a technology that can replace SRAM. And we will discuss that also. Okay, let's talk about, so don't, don't think of these just as replacements for DRAM. If you know the properties of the technology and its characteristics in terms of latency, area, cost, it's good to think about where it could be in the hierarchy, right? So I'm going to show you a, a PCM, but we're also going to talk about the CTM. Any questions so far? I'm going to go a little bit more into detail in phase change memory. I think I've already said this. Uh, there are two states in phase change material. Uh, amorphous, it has low optical reflectivity and high electrical resistivity and crystalline, uh, high optical reflectivity and low electrical resistivity. Now, what is, cons uh, what is interesting to us is how do you detect uh, the electrical resistivity of the material? And that's where a lot of device level innovation have been made to make this work. That's why this has become interesting in early 2000s, because that device level innovation showed that you could read uh, from uh, a phase change memory cell reliably using an access device that people have developed, basically. Uh, and this is how uh, things look like, let's say. You have this chalcogenide material, and you have a heater, and then there are access. Uh, this is the word line, and this is the bit line, as you can see. Uh, so it's resistive memory. So high resistance means, let's say, you encode high resistance with some value and low resistance with some value. And people have shown that PCM cell can be switched between different states reliably and relatively quickly. We will see the numbers in terms of quickly. It's not as quick as DRAM, unfortunately. So how does this work? Uh, basically, when you want to write uh, to a cell, you, change its, you try to change its phase by injecting current. If you want to set the cell to one, let's say, assuming setting means setting to one, uh, you sustain the current to heat the cell above some crystallization temperature and you keep it like that uh, for some time. And after some time, phase change happens, basically, and then you stop uh, that current. To reset the cell, you actually need to heat the cell significantly above some melting temperature and then quench it quickly. Uh, so there's some time, clearly, to build up to that uh, temperature and build down afterwards. So these are actually quite high temperatures, as we will see. And that's one of the downsides uh, of this technology, actually. You have to reach very high temperatures to actually do things to it. And that's one of the limitations, I would say, actually, uh, in terms of power in terms of uh, buildability, uh, et cetera. So basically, when we were actually first looking at this, we had a lot of doubts also about the technology. But as an architect, you have to study, right? As a scientist, you have to study the implications. You cannot just dismiss something because at that point, it may not uh, be easy to implement. And these may be some of the issues that uh, may have led to decisions uh, by companies to not follow through, right? This temperature issue, I think, is actually important, frankly. Uh, this also limits your write bandwidth, for example. This temperature, if it's really high, uh, the number of writes, the number of reset operations that you're doing uh, uh, may be uh, uh, limited. Uh, uh, concurrent, uh, the con concurrent number of writes that you're doing may be limited. Or you can run into reliability issues if you do too many writes. Right? So there are actually a lot of interesting things uh, at the lower levels to study also. 
So that's why it's fascinating if you want to build a new technology. So reading is det you detect phase, uh, det detect the phase of the cell uh, by examining its resistance somehow, right? And we will see one way of doing it. Again, I'm not going to go into the device level details. But this is what uh, the different states look like. These are real pictures of real cells. Uh, essentially, this is a set state. You have low resistance and the resistance value is here. These are old numbers. You can find them uh, from IBM's publications. Uh, and reset state looks like this. You can basically see, you can actually see the reset state over here, right? Uh, uh, but basically, uh, you get small current because high, uh, and high resistance, and the resistance is quite high, as you can see. So the key basically is uh, uh, you, you get huge difference uh, between uh, the resistance values, uh, reset and set. This is also called on-off ratio. And that huge difference is very important uh, if you want to look at an emerging technology because you want to reliably distinguish between different states. And that's one of the reasons why this was very interesting to us because that uh, differential between on and off uh, ratio is quite high here. So uh, let's pull back uh, to uh, the architectural level. So what are the advantages uh, of this uh, if you look at the uh, properties of this? So it turns out this scales better than DM and flash. A lot of studies have shown that. And as I, if you want to really understand this exactly, I'd recommend reading this paper from IBM Journal and Research and Development from 2008 that talks about scalability of phase change memory. IBM actually has written a lot of other papers on the lack of scalability on DRAM as well. So they have a 2002 paper by Mandelman uh, in the same journal, Journal of Research and Development, that talks about scalability challenge of DRAM. This is 2002 at the device level. Uh, the... Um, the, the, um, the inventor of DRAM is a co-author on that paper, Bob Denard, actually. <laughs> That's a 2002 paper, not this paper. This is basically arguing that PCM is a scalable alternative. Uh, okay. It can be denser than DRAM, as we have discussed. And actually, there were many prototypes uh, that were showed four bits per cell as well. This is an old slide, four bits per cell by 2012. It's non-volatile. And no refresh is needed. You get low idle power. This actually, because it's not charge-based, it doesn't have the... Uh, degradation uh, that uh, flash has. So it, it's truly, it's, it's, it, this is really a memory that where truly no refresh is needed for the purpose of replenishing the charge. Now, there are some other issues that may require things like refresh. It turns out uh, there's some shifting of resistance that happens over time at a very, very large time scale. So you may still need to refresh in some way, but that's, uh, that's an interesting issue that people are examining. So you get also very low idle power uh, as well. So basically, uh, this is uh, how you represent the value. You have cell resistance, and you have a threshold uh, value over here, and then cell value could be one or zero. That's not exactly how you would read it, but this is uh, abstract level of thinking, right? Multi-level cell PCM, basically, you can have more than one bit per cell. Uh, unfortunately, as we will see also, this leads to higher latency and energy than single-level cell. So reading this single level, uh, distinguishing between two levels is easy because you need to have one reference. When you go to multi-level cell, you need to have three reference voltages, as you can see. And you can do a binary search, for example. You can first check this level, and then you can then check uh, either this level or this level, depending on where your resistance falls, right? It's not exactly how it works again, as we will see. Uh, it, depend, it depends on your read device, but that's the intuitive way of thinking, right? Now, this, intuitively, this should be longer latency to read both bits uh, than just detecting uh, the difference between uh, two two levels. And reality is also like that, basically. Okay, so basically this needs more precise sensing and modification of cell contents because if you divide the resistance into four different levels, uh, you essentially have less noise margin, right? Uh, clearly, uh, your, your, uh, the, uh, the range of resistance becomes smaller to represent a value, whereas it used to be this whole range for you to represent uh, what, a value. So as a result, you get higher latency and energy. And we will see that uh, after we discuss some other things. Okay, so we actually surveyed, well, we were very interested in this. So we uh, surveyed the properties of uh, phase change memory devices that were prototyped by many different people, both academics as well as industry, in conferences like uh, electron devices meeting, VLSI, circuits, et cetera. And many people were developed, trying to develop things. Many is uh, an exaggeration in the grand scheme of things. A number of people, a really small number of people in the grand scheme of things were developing, but many interesting people doing cutting edge work were developing things 
uh, at the lower levels, like device levels and circuit levels, right? And we tried to derive some parameters for a future size of 90 nanometers. And at that time, the new future size was large for this technology, especially for prototypes, right? But we believe that it's scalable based on uh, what's demonstrated scientifically. So this is uh, basically uh, a study that we did. These are the major works that developed phase change memory prototypes at the time. Remember that this is, uh, our paper was published in 2009, uh, and we actually show uh, different papers over here published by different people. I, I guess we don't really reveal who they are, but you can find the references. Some of them are, for example, Micron, uh, Samsung, SK Hynix, I believe, is also here, but I don't know. Uh, IBM is also here somewhere. I don't know which one's which, don't ask me. But you can see that uh, these tech, this tech, there, there are a lot of unknowns in some of these prototypes. For example, this prototype from 2003, you don't know much, right? You, don't, you know some things, like the material, uh, set time, set current, reset time, reset current, and write endurance, which we will talk about, but not a lot of other things. Uh, there's another one here, I think this is from Micron, actually, that has a lot of uh, results, so that's good. And we actually based a lot of our things on this one, but we tried to actually calibrate based on the other ones also because it's an older one. Uh, but basically, this is what happens when you actually deal with an emerging technology. Essentially, the takeaway from this is you don't know much, a whole lot. And some things are not consistent, right? And even, even the way they report results is not consistent. The technology is not exactly the same. You can see that the access device is different in different technologies. Some of them do not even report the access device. Uh, the material is different in some of them. Uh, and then uh, the process is different. Even array size are uh, different, as you can see, although things are become larger more recently over here. But then again, you don't have a lot of, uh, you, there are things that you don't know. So we wanted to basically characterize this and understand it. So right endurance is important because uh, if I, if this is unfortunate for a phase change memory. Basically, this is the number of writes that you can do to a cell before you cannot do a write or read to the cell. Essentially, the, cells die, the cell dies after that many writes. You can think of it that way. It's clearly an endurance problem. And this is unfortunate because, and this is going to uh, cause us problems when we are trying to replace DRAM uh, with phase change memory because uh, it's going to limit the number of writes that you can do to this technology. And if you are using a technology as main memory, you're going to naturally do a lot of writes uh, to that technology. Right? And the numbers over here you can see is 10 to the 9 maximum, 10 to the 4 minimum. That's very, uh, I think that's very pessimistic actually, but they, that's what they have reported. Okay, so let's take a look. So where can PCM fit in the system based on the characteristics that we see? So we had some discussion yesterday on uh, like why, D, why is DRAM in the place it is? And that's the reason, this is the reason basically. <laughs> the DRAM is in the place it is because, uh, well, partly, this is the latencies basically. These are the latencies that you get in existing technologies in terms of processor cycles for a four gigahertz processor. You can convert it to nanoseconds clearly. But you can see that the DRAM is uh, on the order of, let's say, 2 to the 8 to 2 to the, two to the 10 over here. Not 2 to the 9, let's say. Uh, so it's on the order of 100 nanoseconds or so, which is actually quite close to SRAM, which is 2, let's say. And then last level cache, which could be, I don't know, 2 to the 5, 2 to the 6, maybe 2 to the 7 if you really have a large one. But you can see the order of magnitude difference between DRAM and flash over here, right? It's about 2 to the 8 over here. And then between flash and hard drive, it's even uh, another two to the eight. Uh, not exactly, but you can think of it that way. Basically, there's a huge gap between here and here and here and here. So flash came here because let's assume that this didn't exist before. Between DRAM and hard drive, flash came and it basically solidified a very nice position clearly. Now the question is, where does PCM fit? And this is actually where PCM was projected to fit based on the studies that we have done and uh, that, that others have done that we have surveyed. But it's not as good as DRAM. That's the unfortunate part. Right? Basically, uh, read latency is worse than DRAM, much better than flash. So it's closer to DRAM, as you can see. Write latency is unfortunately worse than DRAM, but it's still much better than flash. We don't even report it over here. Write bandwidth is worse than DRAM, similar to flash. Now, this is actually interesting because write bandwidth, you can also improve in by increasing the power budget. Uh, so what do you keep constant in these is interesting. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of reds over here, basically. You can see all of these are red compared to DRAM. But still, it's not too bad, let's say. Uh, dynamic energy, uh, it's actually um, much worse than DRAM for writes, especially. 43x, for reads, it's 2x. Closer to flash, again. 
Endurance is much worse than DRAM, uh, but much better than Flash, basically. So DRAM, uh, as far as we know, as we have discussed, it doesn't have an endurance problem, or people have not reported endurance problems because, or maybe you have not, we have not seen endurance problems in the time frames that we have studied DRAM. Uh, but uh, Flash is an endurance problem. It's really bad, actually. Uh, so uh, uh, as we discussed also yesterday, in modern multi-level cell Flash, you may do 100 writes and then a cell dies. Now, this is much better. Uh, in uh, in single-level cell PCM, we basically assumed 10 to the 8 writes per cell. Now, with multi-level cell, this may actually reduce also. But basically, this endurance problem happens because when you write to a cell, you use very high temperatures. And these high temperatures degrade the contacts because of thermal expansion and contraction. And if you do that enough times, you basically essentially break the writing, writing circuitry. Those, those contacts break. As a result, you cannot write or read reliably. That's the mechanism that has been reported in literature. Cell size, this is where actually you're, uh, you can be better than DRAM because you can scale uh, with feature size. And you're, uh, uh, even though we don't show better than DRAM, with the scaling and multi-level cell, uh, this is going to be much better. And cell size is also larger than NAND uh, at the time. Again. So if you want to summarize these things as an architectural, uh, like uh, pros and cons, uh, hopefully we get better technology scaling, better capacity and cost over time, especially. It's non-volatile, so it's persistent. So this could have other implications. It could potentially be used for persistent data, as we will see later. And as low idle power, so refresh problem goes away. So a major scaling problem of DM. Uh, goes away. Unfortunately, there are downsides. Latencies are higher. So basically, cost and capacity trends are quite good. Assuming manufacturing hurdles are solved, uh, cost and capacity uh, can be much better than DM. That's the takeaway over here. Power, idle power uh, can be much better than DM. And you may even have some surpass, surpassing advantage because of the non volatility property of the uh, technology. Now, the downside becomes, especially with latency and dynamic energy. As you can see, as we have discussed, you get especially write latencies that are much higher, but read latencies are also quite high, 4x, let's say. Active energy is quite high compared to DM. Lower endurance, that problem exists that doesn't exist in DM. That's unfortunate. And some, there are some reliability issues. We're going to ignore them for now, like resistance drift that I mentioned. So basically, it's not, a, uh, it's not as easy as, OK, uh, we're all better than DM, so we should replace it. So this is something that needs to be studied and maybe architected. Uh, so that you can actually replace DM or augment DM in some way. So if you want to do that, you need to mitigate these reds as much as possible, right? And you or, uh, and or you need to find the right way to place phase change memory in the system. And that's what we're going to look at uh, now. So this is a picture from our earlier paper. This was drawn in 2008, maybe even 2007, I don't remember. But uh, basically, this is the question we asked. How should uh, PCM-based main memory be organized? Today, we have DRAM. Over time, we thought you would have some hybrid memory. Some part of memory would be DRAM. Some part of memory would be PCM. And if this technology is really scalable, and if we find solutions uh, to uh, the problems, maybe we'll replace the, uh, P DRAM completely. At least it's interesting to understand whether this is well, going to be easy or not. So this is hybrid, PCM, and DRAM. We're going to talk about that. This is actually more viable in the short term, I believe. Uh, and I believe maybe this is the only thing that's viable given a technology like PCM, right? Maybe this is not so reasonable in many cases as our results also kind of show. Uh, here, the issue becomes how do you actually uh, allocate partition and migrate data between DM and PCM? And there are a lot of design questions over here and we'll discuss that. But let's talk about this one. Uh, so this is what we, we were very aggressive basically. We wanted to ask the question, what if you magically replace DRAM with PCM? What kind of performance energy uh, characteristics and also endurance characteristics would you get? And our expectation, our hypothesis was that it's not going to be good if you just replace DRAM with PCM based on what we have discussed, all those characteristics. Then the question becomes, how do you alleviate that and how bad it'll be when you alleviate some of these things? So this opens a new, uh, this opens room for new ideas also, right? How do you design the PCM chip to alleviate some of the shortcomings? How do you design the memory controller to elevate the shortcomings? So there's a lot of studies that have been done in this area. I'll give you some examples. Well, the earliest example, let's say. Any questions? Yes, you go ahead first. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Basically, uh, 
the reason, like, well, personally, uh, the reason why we did not look at that was because we thought it was easy. <laughs> the hard part was this one. <laughs> and uh, that's a very fair and valid question. And we believe that people uh, assuming that, uh, basically, that, that would be an easy problem. Uh, and people have actually introduced products. Before Intel introduced the persistent memory product, they introduced Optane SSD. And we actually did a lot of studies with it also. So you could actually do that relatively easily. Does that make sense? The, uh, the, so the scientific uh, study over there would not be that interesting. It would be a matter of cost. If people could afford the cost of the phase change memory compared to flash, they could replace it. I think the people have actually, there, there were some scientific studies that were done in terms of like hybrid devices. Okay, you have PCM and then flash at the same time. How do you move the data? There's some interesting stuff over there, but we still believe that this was the harder problem. <laughs> because of the properties of the technology. But that's a very good question. And I believe actually phase change memory is a good contender over time for potentially replacing flash or getting rid of a lot of the flash, but we will see. Yes. Which one? SRAM, okay. For SRAM, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, well this, we're not talking about replacing SRAM. It's DRAM, all DRAM. No, no, he said SSD, flash memory, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So if you compare uh, to the flash memory properties, then it's, it looks easier, right? Because your latency is much lower. Uh, your, your light latency is actually closer to flash, but still lower than flash. Right bandwidth is similar to flash. Uh, so dynamic energy is similar to flash. Endurance is better than flash. So you're better than flash except for the cost, which is a well, well, cell size part. I equate cell size with cost, but that's not exactly true, but density part, essentially. That's why we thought it was easy, basically. <laughs> okay, but good question. I think, uh, I think uh, from a business perspective, it, it actually makes a lot of sense to replace uh, flash with PCM, frankly. Okay, so let's talk about uh, what we did. Essentially, we assumed, uh, based on our analysis of technology, at least openly available. Uh, you had a question also, but was that answered? Okay, okay, that's good. Uh, uh, we, based on our analysis of uh, openly available technology results, we assumed uh, some latency, endurance, and energy, basically what I showed you earlier, and then we simulated using simulation. Uh, density is not going to play a role in this because we're going to assume that, uh, assume equal size memory. DRAM and PCM are equal sized, so memory potential memory uh, capacity benefits of PCM are not going to uh, be in, in, in play here. Later, I'm going to show you a study where that takes into account, uh, that assumes that uh, phase change memory would be much cheaper uh, and shows a better benefits. So that's a more optimistic study than our study. Our study was pessimistic uh, a little bit because we didn't take into account uh, the capacity benefits of uh, PCM, which we thought were important in the future, but we wanted to really look at the technology as is with equal capacity uh, for DRAM and uh, PCM. Okay, so if you actually go and do simulation, this is actually where simulation is beautiful, right? You have a simulator that models DRAM, and then you basically change that simulator to also model PCM, these properties, and some endurance simulation. This is what you get, essentially. This is what we did. We replaced DRAM with PCM in a four-core, four-megabyte system. This is actually a small system, but it's okay. PCM is organized, assume, we assume PCM is organized the same way as DRAM. Basically, you can think of this as it's exactly the same as DRAM. You just change the DRAM cells with PCM cells and use the characteristics, uh, latency, energy, endurance characteristics of the PCM cell. And we simulated some workloads. You can see here, the average is over here. And basically, the results don't look good. Uh, average across these workloads, the, your performance uh, degrades by 60%. Your energy increases by let's say 120 to 20%, and your memory gets destroyed after 500 hours for some definition of destroyed, right? I think in this case, we use 10% of the memory goes away, but you should look at the paper because I don't remember, frankly. <laughs> but definitely, there should be a definition of destruction of memory, right? If your 10% of your memory goes away, that's probably actually pretty bad in 500 hours, right? So basically, it looks pretty bad, right? And there are some uh, workloads that suffer a lot of uh, losses in terms of performance and energy. And also, there are some workloads that uh, 
uh, destroy your memory even faster than $500, right? So the reason uh, you get this 500 hour average lifetime is because uh, you're really exposing all your rights out of your cache hierarchy to a phase change memory directly, right? That's the reason. And there are a lot of rights that are happening uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from, uh, from your processor to main memory. This is different from the SSD, right? In SSD, as we discussed, there's a system and that manages the rights. And there's a DRAM inside the SSD itself to manage the rights as we discussed yesterday. We're gonna see a similar solution uh, to be employed soon uh, in hybrid memory. But here, there's no hybrid memory. We're, we're, we're comparing pure DRAM to pure PCM. So the result doesn't look good. So what did we do? Basically, we tried to architect phase change memory chips differently from DRAM chips so that we could take advantage of uh, we could basically reduce the problems. So there are a bunch of ideas that we've examined. I'm going to give you two of them. Uh, one of them is DRAM uh, uses full sense amplifiers for a row, and it has to use full sense amplifiers or, for a row because when you activate data, you have to sense everything and restore everything. But PCM doesn't have to use full sense amplifiers for a same row. PCM, in, the P, in PCM, this row buffer doesn't need to be as large as DRAM because PCM is non-volatile. When you activate something, you don't lose the value over there. You're just detecting the data. So basically, this is where you can re-architect the phase change memory chip in a different way than DRAM, because here DRAM reads are destructive. Activation destroys the data in the cell. So you have to have a sense amplifier for every single cell that you activate to restore the data back. In phase change memory, that's not the case. You can just activate a bunch of cells and read a, a small fraction of them, right? That's what we did essentially. Of course, you can actually optimize this also. You don't need to activate all of those rows, and that's essentially you can do. So you can actually reduce the energy uh, compared to DRAM because by taking advantage of the fact that uh, activation actually doesn't reduce the, uh, uh, doesn't destroy the data. So what we did was basically have small sense amplifiers, and, but, and then use the area budget uh, of these sense amplifiers that exist in DRAM for a small cache over here, essentially a buffer. And you can manage this cache at the memory controller level. So this and this are equal in size, uh, but here you can, you're managing, let's say, I don't know, eight uh, of these, uh, I don't know, I don't wanna make up, but uh, maybe I should make up. Uh, maybe you have 16 things that you manage over here. And these, are six, these, these may belong to 16 different rows, but smaller things. Here you have actually a single row, uh, 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 the same amount of uh, buffer, uh, but it belongs to only a single row. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's the idea, basically. So you can manage this cache now. It adds a little bit more complexity. Uh, and this actually reduces the reads and writes to the array. It's kind of like a small cache, and leads to better endurance, latency, and energy. Especially when you're doing random writes, for example, you can actually reduce the energy. Hopefully, you will have some locality still. If you're completely random, then you have a problem, actually, over here also. Uh, so uh, the takeaway here is, I think, you don't want to write to the phase change memory array. You want to minimize the rights by managing this buffer nice. Ideally, you don't want to read from it also, <laughs> which becomes interesting because reads are also costly, right, in terms of latency. So this is also going to build up to the hybrid memory ideas. And also the, the other uh, issue is endurance and also write latency and write energy. Uh, in DRAM, when you do a write, uh, what is a write essentially? You basically, uh, because of the way things are designed in DRAM, uh, you do a write to the buffer right? Uh, when, you do, when you get a write uh, request, uh, you essentially write to the sense amplifiers and that value gets propagated into the DRAM when you actually do the uh, uh, pre-charge. You need to wait for the write recovery latency so that the value gets settled uh, over there. Essentially, you're writing everything in this buffer uh, back into the DRAM. But with phase change memory, again, by reducing the size of the sense amplifiers, you reduce some of that, but you can also do even, you can even write, uh, write even less. You can only write the bits, individual bits, uh, that have been modified. And other people have proposed this. We didn't, pro we didn't look at individual bits exactly, but we basically reduced the granularity of writes. We write it a word or block granularity. Later, for example, Samsung had proposals where they basically compare the original value that they read to the value that they're going to write and only write the things that have changed uh, back into the array. They're actually interesting papers and patterns that they have shown because they want to eliminate the uh, uh, unnecessary wear uh, on this array. Okay, so it makes sense. So there are a bunch of other ideas that are developed, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about that. So if you actually use these ideas, uh, it looks better. 
basically what it, what does it look like uh, on the same workloads uh, we get 20% performance degradation compared to DRAM which is not so good but not as bad as 60% uh, we get on par energy uh, i still don't quite trust these results i think uh, our energy benefits come from especially idle energy etc but maybe we didn't do the energy modeling perfectly also but okay it looks okay but let's take that with a grain of salt always uh, energy modeling is always harder uh, but uh, the average lifetime improves nicely to 5.6 years, which is not bad. But is that what you want? It's not clear. And this average. So it's good to keep that in mind. So our hope was that scaling actually improves energy, endurance, and density. So all of these, um, maybe except for this, have become better. So energy and endurance become better. Density, hopefully you'll get other benefits in terms of capacity, right? But the delay is very hard to uh, change unless you come up with other methods to overcome the delay, right? That's why latency is very important, right? Okay, so the caveats. So these look like good results. And uh, uh, we said that this looks good, so we should do more studies in it. But unfortunately, there are some downsides also, which is worst case lifetime is much shorter. So there are no guarantees. So if you look at some workloads, uh, essentially the memory gets destroyed within a year or so. I think in the worst case here, within a year. That still doesn't look good. But some workloads, basically, you see, I don't know, 16 years or so. Again, you're limited to simulation. So take all of these with a grain of salt. There may be some other workload that, where, that destroys memory a lot more, right? So these are the workloads that we studied. So worst case lifetime is much worse. So in that sense, we were not very optimistic. Uh, and also intensive applications, memory intensive applications see much larger performance energy degradations. Uh, and again, uh, we see even 60% degradation over here, right? In some applications like FFT over here. That's not great in that sense also. And also, there could be other applications that could lose more. And maybe we even used optimistic phase change memory parameters. And that's actually kind of true uh, compared uh, based on the parameters that we've seen from Optane memory. But we were not terribly off also. So basically, our conclusion was this is actually very good to study. There's something here, but it's not clear if uh, DRAM can be replaced by PCM completely, essentially. And you can read the paper. This will, this will be one of the bonus papers also. Or maybe one of the major papers, I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen the homework yet. Any questions? Yes. Hmm. Mm -hmm. How high the temperature is in these studies or? in PCM. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's quite high. I mean, uh, again, uh, this is not something that uh, we were experts in. Uh, and I don't I think Intel has solved the temperature problem somehow and they don't explain exactly what the temperature. So we don't know exactly what the temperature is in the PCM device, but some works show for example 600 degrees, right? <laughs> That's too high, I think. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I don't I don't believe that exactly. But uh yeah. So I think basically we don't know, but there are devices that operate and people have reduced it. But that's a downside, I think. That's a, certainly a downside. The temperature is much higher than the app because you need to increase and quench it. Yeah. Well, uh, you can buy it though. <laughs> but I think that uh, people have, uh, that's one of the, I believe, uh, uh, let's say uh, competitive advantages of doing manufacturing and reducing that. And so there is knowledge about this, but it's not, uh, let's say, disclosed to the public as much. Yeah. That's where I think uh, a lot of things can go well or wrong, in my opinion. So temperature is a big problem, actually, here. So you're, you're on spot with that <laughs> thinking. <laughs> yeah. So at least the reliable tissues also, actually, not just, uh, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a good question. I mean, part of the answer is I don't know <laughs> because it depends on how many levels you chop it into. People have shown prototypes of, uh, I think, even four bits per cell. Uh, 
Yeah, but I, there's no good data on reliability. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think intuitively, uh, your noise margin reduces and your, uh, sense, uh, your sensing circuit needs to be more reliable. So cost, at least cost increase and latency increase also clearly. So we have a lot more reliable data on latency and energy. Uh, certainly as you reduce, uh, as you increase the uh, multi-levelness, let's say number of bits that you store, both latency and energy increases. But I believe reliability also reduces. <laughs> like we did a lot of study on flash memory, which we have access to. And that's a clear trend base because multi-level cell, triple uh, TLC uh, or QLC, uh, uh, QLCs, I think, uh, four bits per cell. Uh, essentially, your reliability degrades significantly, your endurance degrades significantly also. But we don't have any, let's say, solid data on PCM that's published on those topics. There's some, but <laughs> yeah. Okay, so these are good questions. Anything else? Okay, so uh, yeah, I think there's more in this paper, and this, is, this paper also has some more ideas and also is a summary uh, of the previous one. So uh, yes, as I said, this technology exists and you can buy it, you can experiment with it. And there are actually papers that are written looking at the performance analysis. And I don't believe the performance analysis is that much off of, with these real devices compared to our paper. So our paper was kind of pessimistic, but also it was uh, mildly optimistic in the sense that we should really try to uh, architect new technologies to uh, uh, replace DRAM. Uh, but the results were not uh, as promising, let's say. But I think the real system results kind of uh, validated uh, what we showed, but I think there's still opportunity here. Uh, now, let me talk about one thing and then we should take a break, uh, but uh, we should talk about multi-level cell a little bit. Uh, essentially, the key takeaway over here is that once you go to multi-level cell, uh, some bits take longer to read. And this makes actually issue, uh, this makes the problem actually worse a little bit because it's already a longer latency technology compared to DRAM. Once you go to multi-level cell to increase capacity, it becomes even longer latency, right? And also higher energy. It's already a higher energy technology compared to DRAM also. But you get, you get higher capacity also. So there's a trade-off. Again, the fundamental trade-off between latency and capacity exists over here. You can increase the capacity, but latency increases in a different way. And also your energy increases. Uh, but basically, uh, sensing time is longer for higher cell resistances. So if you actually divide the uh, uh, resistance range into uh, four, uh, the most significant bit takes longer time to read, least significant bit takes shorter time to read, or vice versa. Actually, uh, yeah, we will see. So basically, uh, uh, the read latency and energy of one bit is lower than another bit. And we will see why. Uh, this is due to how PCM cells are read. Flash is also the same, actually. But it, the, I mean, the, this observation is the same for flash memory. Uh, one of the bits is easier to read uh, or faster to read than the other bits and lower energy to read. But the reading mechanism is a little bit different. So this is one simplified reading mechanism. So you have a PCM cell, multi-level cell, uh, with unknown resistance. Uh, you connect it to a capacitor. And that capacitor is filled with some reference voltage. And you figure out how long it takes to drain the reference voltage. And the value uh, in this cell determines how long it takes to drain. And then you measure the time. So this is one reading circuitry that's kind of hypothetical, but also it kind of uh, uh, resembles how some of the reading circuitries work. I don't want to go into the reading devices in detail in this course, clearly. But basically, uh, you can think of it this way. You have you chop the resistance values, oh, sorry, not res yeah, resistance values uh, into four uh, different levels. And this is, uh, you're basically trying to uh, see the voltage level in the capacitor. Initially, the capacitor is full. So if the value in your cell is one, one, the capacitor will drain right away. If the uh, value in your cell is one, zero, the capacitor will drain somewhere over here within some time window. If your value is here, the capacitor will drain within this time window. If your if value is zero, zero, it'll drain within this time window. Okay, that's the idea basically. So once you connect the cell, you drain the capacitor, and if it drains within this time window, you assume that the data value is zero, 01. Of course, non idealities like reliability problems clearly, uh, and the noise margin, like you have discussed earlier, you have discussed earlier, plays a role. So you need to be precise in this. And that's where the reading devices actually become really important. Okay, yes. That's right, but just for the reading device, uh, just for the, uh, let's say, sensing device, not for the cells themselves. Yes. This mechanism requires charges. 
But this, this can be big also, because you're not doing this for, let's say, uh, all of the cells. Again, this, uh, this, you can think of this as a sense amplifiers. Uh, it's a sense amplifier uh, used for reading PCM cells. So you can make this capacitor large and reliable. <laughs> okay, but that's a very good point. Okay, so basically, uh, that's the idea. In a, uh, and here, uh, we observed that in MLC PCM devices, you must wait the maximum time to read both bits so that you're confident uh, on the value. But you can actually infer the information about bit one before this time. So if you look, at, look over here, uh, if, assuming you, encoding is done this way, uh, the, the time to determine bit one's value is bounded here, right? And time to determine bit, one, bit zero's value is bounded here. So essentially, you can determine one's value here confidently that it's one. Uh, and if you actually surpass uh, that time, you're confident that it's zero. Uh, and bit zero's value is determined only when you come over here. Right? So that's the idea. So, and then you can uh, develop uh, a picture that looks like this. Uh, these are the cell state transitions uh, uh, when you read or write, essentially. And uh, essentially, uh, well, these are write datums, actually, sorry. Uh, so a reading I've, I've discussed earlier, you can basically have uh, different reading times for different bits. So most significant bit is read much faster, least significant bit reads the full reading time. But also write transitions are also complex. So if you're writing, uh, if your MSP is zero, zero, and you write some value, uh, some of these transitions take longer or shorter, depending on how things are implemented. But the paper describes this uh, in detail. For example, if you're modifying only the MSP or only the LSP, you can actually reduce the latency significantly. Okay, so some, B, some PCM bits take longer to read, some PCM bits take longer to write. So there's some asymmetry essentially. Uh, and then the question is how do you exploit this? I'm not gonna give you talk about the ideas on how to exploit this, but this paper exploit this in, uh, in multiple ways. And I think these are interesting ways to exploit this. It complicates the system, but it's trying to get rid of some of the latency overhead uh, of this memory. Because one of the reasons why I think uh, this is hard to make work, like we place DRAM is a latency overhead. And if you make it even higher latency overhead, then there's a, uh, an even bigger problem. Any questions? Okay, I didn't give you much over here, but uh, you can guess what uh, the, the idea over here is. You basically have data mapping and buffering techniques to reduce the latency. Okay, uh, I think we should take a break right now, and then we will continue with STTM RAM. Okay, let's take a 14 minute break and come back at five, uh, 15, not five. Five would be a bit late. <laughs>
Okay, let's get started. The sound is working, right? On Zoom, YouTube, wherever. Is it good? Hello? I can see it here. Yeah, okay. Okay, so you talk a little bit about phase change memory, uh, which is quite interesting. I'm going to give you another memory technology. Uh, but you can imagine doing this for different memory technologies, right? Uh, especially if a memory technology is not scaling very well. It's good to understand how it compares to other technologies. And we've done the study with STTM RAM, which is also a very interesting technology. Uh, but I will give you the caveats of it also. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some other things that are related to phase change memory. We're going to go back to phase change memory a little bit more. Uh, but STTM RAM is also an interesting uh, let's say emerging memory technology. And there are already memory devices that exist actually uh, on this. There's a company called Everspin. Uh, you can probably negotiate a deal with them and get their memory. Uh, I don't know how it works, you will see. But it's based on these principles. Uh, essentially, uh, you have a magnetic tunnel junction device. Uh, it looks, whoop. yeah, it's essentially your device. Uh, it looks like this basically. Uh, it has two layers. Uh, one is a reference layer. Uh, which has fixed magnetic orientation, and it's a free layer uh, that can be in parallel or anti-parallel uh, to this reference layer in terms of magnetic orientation. And there's some barrier in between them. So you, the magnetic orientation of this free layer that you can program, let's say, or change, determines the logical state of the device, whether the device has high resistance or low resistance. This is high resistance, for example, this is low resistance, or vice versa. Uh, and this is one way of constructing this MTJ device, essentially. Uh, now, this is interesting because uh, there is also a large resistance range uh, difference uh, between these logical zero or logical one, high resistance versus low resistance states. And you can essentially read uh, the data by distinguishing the current flow uh, that happens in these two states. So there's, an, again, a read device. Again, I'm not going to go into the read devices, but people are reliably... Uh, uh, develop sense amplifiers to distinguish between these two states. And you can, uh, when you write to this device, you need to push large current through the magnetic tunnel junction to change the orientation of the free layer. So basically, you need to overcome uh, some resistance uh, to actually uh, change the state of the device. So, writes are again problematic over here. As you can see, there's a large current over here. So, it can take longer time and higher energy. Uh, it may not be as bad as uh, uh, phase change memory, uh, but we will see. Uh, so that's the idea, basically. So that's a completely different uh, device, as you can see. And again, it's based on resistance. Uh, it encodes data based on resistance and not charge. And this is a paper that describes the technology relatively. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an architecture paper that drives the technology. I'm going to mention what we did related to this. So let's take a look at, again, uh, the pros and cons. Pros are very similar to phase change memory, actually. Uh, it has better technology scaling, capacity, and cost uh, compared to DRAM, and potentially compared to SRAM also. Uh, it's non-volatile, persistent, and it has low idle power, no refresh. Cons, now here reads are actually better. Uh, if you look at the read, the sensing of the current flow uh, is actually not that bad. Uh, so reads are actually uh, as fast or could be as fast as DRAM, and it, has, it is as fast as DRAM. It could actually be made even faster potentially, as you reduce the capacity. Uh, the issue with it is writes. So you get higher write latency and higher write energy because you need to push a large amount of current. And it's not as bad as PCM in terms of write latency and energy also. So there's some good news here. Uh, there are reliability issues we're going to ignore. All of these technologies have some reliability issues. And especially when they scale down to the, uh, uh, the um, feature size of DRAM, they're going to have even more reliability issues. So that's why we're kind of ignoring that part. But the unfortunate part here is a poor density currently. So currently its density uh, is quite uh, poor. So the cell size is quite large. Uh, even then people have developed devices uh, like, to, uh, like DRAM uh, or main memory devices. Uh, but I think the density is a limiter uh, for uh, being, a, uh, let's say, good competitor to DRAM at this point. But assuming this technology scaling continues, this may actually uh, be a contender for replacing DRAM because it has actually nice characteristics in terms of uh, read latency and read energy, especially. 
And write latency and write energy is interesting because uh, you can reduce the write latency and energy by giving up some uh, non-volatility. That's the idea over here. You can reduce the size of the magnetic tunnel junction. That reduces the write latency and energy because now you need to push a little bit less current to overcome the smaller size. Uh, unfortunately, it also uh, reduces the non-volatility. So there's a trade-off over here, uh, uh, which is also interesting. People have examined that uh, trade-off to some extent uh, as well. So you can see that this looks kind of nicer, right, compared to PCM. Uh, unfortunately, it may be a bit longer term to replace DEM. And uh, it is actually also looked at as a potential replacement for SJAM uh, because uh, it, uh, it, it, it's, its cell sizes are actually closer to SJAM today, and it, it can scale much better than SJAM. And its read and light latency are actually not bad. Uh, so there are studies that have looked at SJAM also. So you could see it on chip uh, some time into the future, maybe. That may be actually even more viable uh, compared to uh, having it in memory. So we did a similar study uh, with STTM RAM. Uh, I'm going to give you the results. Basically, the results look even better than uh, DRAM, uh, even better than replacing DRAM with PCM. Uh, again, uh, using simulation, we studied a bunch of workloads, a similar type of uh, system. And we see essentially within 10% performance loss on average uh, compared to DRAM, which is not bad. And also, uh, not only on average, but also uh, in the worst case as well. Uh, and the energy savings is much larger uh, compared to PCM because you don't have the read energy problem and you don't have the write energy problem as bad. Uh, uh, and also, you still don't have refresh over here. So idle power is lower. Idle power of this is even lower than PCM, actually. And you also have the temperature, some of the temperature issues that uh, PCM has. So you can see that this technology actually looks better, right? Uh, but of course, this happens after you do some optimizations. So this is the optimized uh, DRAM that actually leads to better energy and better performance. But you can read the paper for more detail. So here, basically, the optimizations that you do uh, need to overcome the write issues, essentially. Those are the major issues. Reads are much harder to overcome. And we've seen that with PCM a little bit. But as I said, I think this is a bit of longer term. Uh, even though the uh, STTM RAM devices exist that you can plug into, uh, your, I think they are DDR3 compatible. Maybe there are DDR4 compatible devices also. Does anybody know, Rakesh? Is there a DDR4 compatible STTM RAM module you can get today? I don't know. I think I know that there are certainly DDR3 compatible ones. Uh, even though they exist, I think they suffer from uh, essentially what we have discussed, this poor density. So they could be quite expensive. But the downside, upside is, I think you can potentially take advantage of non-volatility of it, uh, which becomes interesting now. So you can actually make some other trade-off, right? Get rid of DRAM, uh, make your main memory non-volatile, uh, and pay the penalty of poor density, assuming you can take advantage of that non-volatile memory over there. Uh, and we will discuss that a little bit uh, later. Because uh, right now, you have volatile memory, and that actually introduced a lot of overhead when you're manip manipulating persistent data like disk uh, uh, data that you want to persist, for example, uh, you may actually run into issues as we will discuss. Okay, so this is the paper, oh, which is gone. <laughs> okay, now let's talk about, uh, unless there are questions, let's talk about uh, putting multiple technologies together. Because this seems more like a viable approach, right? Uh, based on what we have discussed. This is, uh, I think I've kind of shown you that DM is hard to replace for various reasons. Uh, People have also looked at memristors. This was especially a technology developed by HP, HP Labs, and they've been writing papers about it. Uh, and they've been showing good results also. But again, that technology also has not materialized. Uh, it has not materialized actually yet uh, to uh, replace DRAM. So hybrid main memory is a good option. And this is a picture that I showed you earlier. The idea over here is very general. Uh, put multiple different technologies together that have different characteristics and manage those technologies uh, in hardware and software so that you exercise the uh, upsides of each technology as much as possible while avoiding the downsides of each technology as much as possible. And this, as, as we have discussed earlier, this motivates that you have some intelligence management mechanism in the controllers, in the software, in the hardware, across the stack, basically, you need to have some intelligence uh, that takes into account the characteristics of the different devices, as well as the characteristics of the data and access patterns uh, 
So this is actually important, I think. You need to match the characters of the data to the characters of your device. So this is a big challenge and opportunities. And there's been a lot of research in this direction. It's still going on. How do you provide the best of multiple metrics with multiple memory technologies? And this, as, uh, as I said, is, it has spurred a lot of research on heterogeneous, configurable, and programmable memory systems. I'll give you a glimpse of it, but we, can, we clearly cannot cover uh, a lot of things. And once you go to a hybrid memory system that looks like that, uh, you run into many issues. By the way, I should also go back. Uh, this could also happen uh, with DRAM and Flash, right? Those are two existing technologies, and people have looked at that also. They've tried developing uh, main memory uh, that's uh, basically main memory that consists of DRAM as well as Flash, uh, and uh, not exactly like this. You don't have a flash controller from the CPU, but you can imagine a device that has DRAM and flash at the same time, like a current SSD, but DRAM is still your main memory that's off the CPU, basically. Uh, and people have looked at that uh, to provide very large capacity main memory. Clearly, with flash, you can provide uh, terabytes and terabytes and terabytes, right? With DRAM, you can have gigabytes and gigabytes. I mean, you're getting close to terabytes also today, but... Uh, but basically, uh, you can have a small amount of DRAM and large amount of flash and manage it intelligently. Now, this is certainly interesting, and that's also uh, interesting to the research in, but the latency gap between DRAM and flash is huge, basically. So that's one downside uh, that all, a lot of those studies have shown. There's a huge latency gap between DRAM and flash. In order to do this management, uh, you need to be extremely careful, basically. If you don't bring some data to DRAM, whereas it should be in DRAM, then you have a problem uh, because you have a huge latency overhead. And you can also do, uh, use the same idea, this heterogeneous memory idea inside the CPU. People have also looked at that, like having heterogeneous caches, right? Some part of the caches, SRAM, some part of the caches, I don't know, STTM RAM. Uh, they have different characteristics, clearly. One of them has write, or high write latency. SRAM clearly doesn't have a high, high write latency. Reads and writes are symmetric in SRAM. Uh, uh, so how do you take advantage of that is interesting. Uh, but STTM RAM can have high capacity, higher capacity than SRAM. Uh, so it's actually very interesting. Uh, this general idea of heterogeneous or hybrid memory systems is very interesting. And as I said also earlier, uh, the SSD, a current SSD itself is a hybrid system. Uh, there's a DRAM that's used there, but it's used for a very special purpose to ensure that you don't do a lot of writes uh, to uh, DRAM. It's used kind of like a write buffer uh, today uh, in, uh, in an SSD. And also there are other, thing, other things stored in, uh, in DRAM uh, that does the mapping. Okay. Okay. So if you if you focus on hybrid main memory, uh, then ma there are many questions actually. Uh, what should be uh, like? Sh should one of the technologies be used as a cache for the other, or should both of these technologies be visible to the programmer and the operating system as main memory? Meaning, uh, the main memory space should that be partitioned between different technologies, or should one of these be a cache, either programmer managed or hardware managed? So the people have looked at both options. Uh, I'm going to talk about the cache option, uh, but there's no reason why one memory cannot be, uh, both memories cannot be part of the main memory space. How do you move the data between memories? What is the granularity of data movement? Is it coarse and fine? Do you provide support for that data movement? Because data movement is, uh, like if you look at this picture over here, data movement is actually expensive, right? And that's something we were trying to eliminate with processing in memory. Now, if you want to manage these memories, you need to move data back and forth. Especially if you use this as a cache, for example, uh, you may want to actually uh, access this as much as possible. So you move the data. What's the granularity? Is it four kilobytes? Is it 64 bytes? And this actually has a big impact on how much overhead that you have uh, in uh, moving data. And this is also, as I said earlier, this is also not the only way of designing system. You can have DRAM connected to another thing over here, potentially. Uh, and uh, that could also house phase change memory. That complicates the interface a little bit, but we're not going to go into that. Okay, hardware. Uh, how, who should manage these uh, hybrid memory? Uh, uh, hardware, software, or should it be cooperative? And again, there's a lot of research that looked at all types of different approaches. When do you migrate data? When should you migrate data between one technology to another technology? And how do you design a scalable and efficient large cache, assuming you're using one technology as a cache? Because it could be, uh, DRAM could be 512 gigabytes, right? That's a huge cache. How do you actually manage that? That becomes interesting also. And then there are many other questions that some of which we may discuss. So let's talk about one option. This is an early proposal also. And this is concurrent with the work that I mentioned. As I said, our work was a little bit pessimistic in terms of replacing DRAM with PCM. This work was a little bit more optimistic. 
so here, uh, the idea is to have PCM as main memory and DRAM caches memory rows or blocks. The big benefit is you get reduced latency on DRAM cache hits, and you also get write filtering, meaning writes can be buffered in DRAM before they are written to phase change memory. Writes are very problematic in phase change memory, as we discussed, for latency, energy, and endurance. So why not use DRAM as a buffer for those writes? Uh, and the memory controller manages the DRAM cache, so it's purely hardware-based. This eliminates the system software overhead. So I'm going to show you actually multiple works related to this. So here there are three issues. What data should be placed in DRAM versus kept in PCM? That's data placement and data migration. What is the granularity of data movement between these, uh, between the DRAM cache and the phase change memory main memory? And how do you design a low-cost hardware-managed DRAM cache? This is at least three issues, I should say. This is not the only three issues, clearly. So we're going to discuss multiple idea directions, uh, locality-aware data placement, which is based on one of our works, and the other is uh, using cheap tax stores and dynamic granularity management, very briefly. But before that, as I mentioned, uh, this is the, uh, another work from IBM that proposed using DRAM as a cache for phase change memory. Uh, and this is the picture, basically. You can see the picture. Uh, the processor uh, is connected to the DRAM buffer. And DRAM buffer acts as a cache for a main memory that backs up that DRAM buffer. And the idea is, again, uh, the goal is to achieve the best of both DRAM and PCM. Uh, and the idea is to minimize the amount of DRAM without sacrificing performance and endurance, because this is slow. Uh, uh, and I think this work assumes 4x latency. It doesn't assume that writes are much, uh, our, our work assumes writes are much uh, longer latency, like 15x. I think it's what we assume 12x, but this work assumes both reads and writes are there 4x. I believe writes actually require a lot more latency than what's assumed in this work. But basically, it's trying to uh, buffer data inside the DRAM and do as little uh, as, as few as possible writes to main memory to save endurance. I think I already said that. It's tolerating the PCM latency and write bandwidth was also energy. And the hope is that the PCM can be very large. It can provide large capacity uh, and at good cost and power. And there's another write queue over here. There's another write buffer that it adds over here in addition to uh, the DRAM cache, if you will. Okay, makes sense? Okay. So this work doesn't exactly talk about what should be placed in DRAM, but there's some uh, uh, discussion over there. I'm not going to talk. I, I guess we'll talk about it briefly here. But basically, uh, there are multiple ideas that are used here. Uh, you have lazy write. Uh, when you do it, uh, when you bring a page uh, from a disk, you directly bring it into uh, the DRAM and not PCM. Uh, that way, basically, you don't write into PCM directly. You write into PCM lazily, essentially the updated blocks. Actually, partial writes, the idea that we've discussed earlier, only dirty blocks from DRAM page are written back to PCM. So basically, you don't bring the data into the PCM main memory. That's good, uh, because that saves a lot of latency also. There's also a page bypass, which is uh, you discard pages with poor reuse on DRAM eviction. So if you find you have some counters over here, and if, if the DM, when you're trying to evict some page over here because you need to bring something else, uh, you discard uh, pages that are not received uh, much reuse. Uh, you don't write them back to phase change memory main memory. So you can basically have management strategies, and this paper talks about some of them. It's interesting, I think. And this paper actually, as I said, has optimistic results. This is uh, even higher level simulation. Our, our simulator was actually quite accurate in terms of how it mo models main memory. This actually uh, takes a higher level of abstraction, if you will. It basically has, you can see the parameters over there, but it also models hard disk uh, with flash. You can see the latencies over there, 32 microseconds and 2 milliseconds. It assumes a flash hit rate of 99%, uh, basically. So there's some probabilistic modeling that also goes on in the simulator because if you model everything perfectly over there, you get uh, too slow simulation. And the assumption uh, this uh, simulator makes is PCM is 4x denser and 4x slower than DM. So it's actually modeling the memory capacity effects. So if you actually have a miss in PCM, meaning a page fault, you actually model that. And you actually see if it hits in flash. If it doesn't hit in flash, you also go to the hard disk. Uh, so there's a full, uh, as much as possible, uh, modeling of the entire memory and storage hierarchy to see the benefits of the, uh, of the capacity, uh, to, to see the capacity benefits of phase change memory. And this is assuming DRAM block size is the same as PCM page size, as you can see. So let's take a look at the results. 
So this is uh, a bunch of workloads, again, from IBM. Uh, and you can see the normalized execution time to 8 gigabytes of DRAM. Uh, those are the red bars. Uh, now, if you look at uh, 32 gigabytes of PCM, uh, it actually improves performance significantly. This is different from our result because we didn't assume a larger PCM. We just assume equal side, equal side PCM and DRAM, right? So basically, there's performance benefit to be gained from a denser phase change memory, even though phase change memory has uh, worst latency characteristics, 4x, basically. OK, that's good. That's the system level result. Now, if you look at 32 gigabyte PCM and 30 gigabyte DRAM, they look quite similar to each other. Well, 30 gigabyte DRAM is much faster, as you can see. This is kind of similar to our result, actually. So there's some uh, concurrent work that uh, looks similar in terms of the result. So that's actually satisfying, I would say. Uh, 30, this is average. 30 gigabyte PCM is much slower compared to 30 gigabyte DRAM. Now, the interesting thing here is the hybrid memory proposal, which is you have 32 gigabyte PCM and one gigabyte of DRAM, but DRAM is used as a cache. So your main memory is still 32 gigabytes, but uh, you have an additional one gigabyte cache DRAM. And that actually improves the performance, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, compared to 32 gigabyte PCM itself significantly. And it gets close to the performance of 32 gigabyte DRAM. Right, that's the idea. Without having the cost of 32 gigabyte DRAM, that's the assumption, right? Because 32 gigabyte DRAM is equivalent to 128 gigabyte PCM, assuming uh, what uh, they assume over here in terms of cost. Does that make sense? So basically, this is a more positive result. Uh, we'll see if it pans out into the future. Uh, but uh, I think it's good to study uh, this at a different level, like these folks did. Uh, and uh, basically, the takeaway is PCM DRAM hybrid performs similar to similar size DRAM. And that's good. That's what we would like to achieve. And there's also energy and power results, just like our paper. Significant, and these, this work shows significant energy savings with PCM DRAM hybrid. Let me try to find it. Yeah, it's over here, basically. This is the hybrid memory. Actually, PCM DRAM hybrid is uh, much lower energy than just 8 gigabyte DRAM, as well as 32 gigabyte DRAM, uh, as you can see over there. Uh, and the average lifetime is also, they do some lifetime analysis, which is not shown here, but uh, you get much higher lifetime because you use the DRAM cache as a write filtering buffer. Uh, but no guarantees still, right? This is higher than what our paper reported, but you get no guarantees. So if you look at the full system uh, level, you get energy savings, as you can see over here, uh, uh, and better endurance. Uh, better endurance compared to our work. So if you remember our work, we showed 5.6 years, right? Here, it's 9.7 years on average across those workloads, different workloads, uh, but no guarantees still, right? Basically, no guarantees uh, means that some workload may thrash the DRAM cache and it can lead to much worse endurance or much worse lifetime. Okay, so if you want to read that paper, that's uh, also going to be in uh, one of those readings. Uh, that is a bonus, let's say. Any questions? Okay. Now let's talk about this general problem of data placement and hybrid memory, because I think this becomes interesting. And this is a general problem in general, uh, because you may have multiple different memories. It may not be exactly connected to these two, two different channels, but this is one way of thinking about it. You may have memory A that's fast and small, and memory B that's large and slow, right? This could be done in the same technology also, actually. Uh, but this is also a little bit simplified because there are other characteristics of memories that are kind of being ignored over here, right? But I think sometimes it's good to simplify things as well and then take into account other things. So basically, the question becomes, which memory do you place each page in to maximize system performance? And I think I already said this. So there, there are issues here, right? Uh, memory A is fast but small. But if you place all of the pages in memory A, uh, this channel may be overloaded, whereas this channel may be idle. So it's not just a capacity issue, but it's also a bandwidth issue, assuming the system looks like this, right? So it's good to consider things. And also, whenever you migrate data, you have overheads, right? Both performance and energy. And remember that we want to get rid of these migrations as much as possible uh, with minimizing data movements. So I'll, I'll give you uh, another idea over here. So people have actually looked at how to decide what should be placed in DRAM and PCM, assuming still assuming that DRAM is a cache for PCM. And one general idea is to characterize the access patterns and guide data placement in memory. 
So if you know an access pattern is friendly for one memory and hostile, let's say, for another memory, hostile meaning that it gets bad performance, try to place that access pattern, place that data structure that leads to that access pattern in the friendly memory. That's the idea. This could be done statically by the programmer, or if you can have a compiler that profiles the code and figures out access pattern, again, the compiler can guide it. It could be done dynamically like this paper does, purely in the memory controller. And that's the idea. So the question is, what is friendly and what's not friendly? Uh, very simply, uh, if you're streaming through memory, this could be as fast in PCM as in DM, actually, if you architect the PCM nicely. Uh, but random access are actually much faster than the, in DM compared to PCM. So random accesses mean no robo for locality, right? You actually have lots of conflicts. And DRAM is fundamentally, that DRAM array is fundamentally much faster, both for reads and writes, right? Remember, 4x for reads and 12x for writes. So if you're having random accesses placed in DRAM, basically, that's the key idea. Place random access data with some reuse, hopefully, because you need to access it again uh, in DRAM, streaming data in PCM. So that's the idea that's proposed over here. And uh, the reason, uh, let's go into a little bit more detail. Row buffers exist in both DM and PCM, and row hit latency is similar in DM and PCM, but row miss latency is actually small in DM, but much larger in PCM, because basically row miss latency means that you're accessing the array, not row buffer. Because row buffer is actually essentially, give or take a little bit, essentially similar technology. It kind of looks like SRAM technology inside the DM or PCM chip. So the idea here is to identify data that's likely to miss in the row buffer. This is low row buffer locality. And if, if, th if that's the case, the miss penalty is smaller in DRAM clearly for that. And also are reused many times. Uh, and if the data exhibits these two characteristics together, uh, place the data in DRAM. Why do you want to look at reuse many times? Because you really want to cache only the data that's worth the movement cost between PCM and DRAM, right? And also preserve DRAM space for data that you're going to reuse multiple times, right? So if the data is going to be touched only once and not multiple times or enough times while it's residing in DRAM, it doesn't make sense to move it from PCM to DRAM because it's going to be used only once. Uh, and you're not going to amortize the cost of the data moments from the PCM into the DRAM, right? This is in general true whenever you do data moments. You, need to, you should be able to amortize the cost of data moments in terms of latency. Uh, and performs. This is actually true for the on-chip cache hierarchy also, right? Should you really move the data? Uh, should you really place the data uh, in an on-chip cache if you are almost certain that it's not going to be reused until it gets evicted from the cache, right? Basically, the idea is don't put it in the cache. It's very similar. It applies to any caching in the end. So this paper proposes a hardware-based method to determine these two things, and I'm not going to go into the details of it. You can read the paper again. Uh, this is the high-level idea. Implementation requires some statistics gathering in the memory controller uh, to decide which data is likely to miss and which data is likely to be reused many times. It uses very simple heuristics to determine that. And also, it takes into account write latencies, which, I'm not, which, is, which is not talked about over here. Clearly, there needs to be some, let's say, uh, performance modeling or analytical model that's implemented in the memory controller uh, that takes into account write latency and a little bit also endurance uh, so that you can move the data intelligently. Or you can basically make the trade-off of moving the data uh, into the DRAM cache intelligently. So if you do that, this paper shows some results again. Again, uh, we're assuming equal size PCM and equal size DRAM. Uh, this is different from the assumption that's made uh, in the earlier paper from IBM that basically says 16 gigabyte DRAM is the same cost as 64 gigabyte PCM. That's a different world, let's say. Maybe it's true at some, at some point in time, but we didn't make that assumption. Uh, our, uh, basically, we are comparing 16 gigabyte PCM to 16 gigabyte DRAM, and clearly there's a huge gap between them, similar to our work. This actually, these are workloads that are quite intensive uh, for memory, so that's why you see a very large gap. And uh, the mechanism that I just discussed kind of gets you in between but it doesn't get you very close to uh, 16 gigabyte DRAM. So not bad, let's say. <laughs> and then there's other work that has improved over this, so I'm not talk talking about this. So basically, I think uh, the takeaway is, unless you assume the capacity is really large compared to DRAM, it's very hard to get close to DRAM, even if you have this hybrid memory that intelligently manages things. 
Now, there are other management policies that people have developed. Actually, people have used machine learning, uh, neural networks to, uh, to decide what should be go going where. Uh, yeah, I think the, that result is still quite strong. You can close the gap a little bit, but it's very hard to match uh, or surpass that DM. Whereas the prior work showed that you could surpass the, I believe you could surpass the DM, right? Let's go back. Or you could get close to DM. Right. Yeah, you could get close to DM, right? This is very close, actually. This is within 10, 15% or so. Okay. Okay. So this is one idea. Uh, again, you can read this paper if you're interested. There's a lot more work in this area that I'm not going to talk about. So people have, for example, proposed operating system-driven page placement techniques uh, between uh, hybrid memories. Uh, uh, that's a paper that we talk about in this work also. Uh, operating system during techniques are actually not easily adaptive, but clearly it reduces some of the overhead in the memory controller. So there are trade-offs between software versus hardware management. So people have looked at this a lot, actually. Any questions? Is this interesting? So, so, okay, yeah. So in this, in this work, we assume that there is no connection, basically, meaning you have to go through the memory controller. It looks like this, basically. You have some memory connected to this channel, another memory connected to this channel. And a lot of work assume that, actually. But that, yes, you can imagine uh, ways where you have one channel and there's a hybrid memory device uh, that's connected. There, I think, you, you have even more flexibility, I think, internally. But your interface needs to be a little bit more careful in that device, channel, right? Yeah. On one die, yes. On one die, it may not be easy, yes. But on multiple dice, you can have a DRAM module, or you can have a memory module that mixes multiple different technologies, right? Yeah, but uh, in a single uh, chip, yes, it's very difficult to do. PCM and DRAM because they have completely different manufacturing. Yeah, that's a very good point, basically. But for example, you can do what SSDs do. You can have a, on a on a board. You can have DRAM and uh, flash chips, right? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So there are other works. Uh, let's see how much time we have. That will determine what I skip and what I don't skip, <laughs> because I want to cover uh, some other things also. So I'm not going to talk about this one because I just saw the time. But basically, there are other works that try to improve uh, the page placement using some performance models, taking into account memory level parallelism. Uh, basically, the key idea is to estimate the utility. Uh, and this is a very general work, actually. It, do is, it doesn't apply to PCM, DRAM, but it's generally for any hybrid memory, as this work also demonstrates. Uh, for, for a given page, use some characteristics like profiling characteristics to calculate the estimated utility of migrating the page from one memory to the other in the system. That's the idea. What is utility? Basically, uh, performance impact. Actually, this is, this is really marginal utility. What kind of benefits you would get if you actually migrate this page to this other uh, memory? And the idea is to migrate only the pages with the highest marginal utility. In other words, the pages that improve system performance the most when migrated. This is a general idea, as you can see. Then the question, of course, becomes how do you estimate the marginal utility of migration of a page? And that's where you should read the paper. Uh, basically, there's a performance model that's developed that's implemented in the memory controller. Uh, and uh, that performance model estimates the marginal utility and uh, migrates only pages whose marginal utility exceeds the migration threshold, which is also determined dynamically. As you can see, periodically adjust the migration threshold. Uh, Again, I will not go into details of the model, but you need to take into account uh, how, how much benefit or application stall time reduction do you get, assuming you migrated this page from this memory to this memory. And this, for this, you need to build a performance model. You can see that. That takes into account robo for locality, bank level parallelism, uh, and also uh, the effect on the stall time of the application. So if the latency of the miss is already hidden somehow, migrating it to a faster memory doesn't make sense, right? And there are cases where the latency of a miss is hidden. Uh, that's one of the novelties in this work uh, that it does take into account that. And also you should take into account the 
effect of the application. For example, if you're running multiple applications, how important is this application uh, to the user or the entire system? So it also takes that into account. And it has basically some model uh, that is implemented in the memory controller again. And it turns out this is actually a much higher performance uh, compared to prior mechanisms. Uh, you can see uh, for different workloads, especially when the workloads become more memory intensive over here. Uh, and also it works nicely for different types of memory. For example, these are, uh, this is the latency multiplier for reads, activates, and writes, write recovery. Uh, you can see that uh, it works for, uh, for, for slow memory. You have some uh, fast memory for which the values, normalized values are 1.0, and the slow memory is 3x slower in terms of both reads and writes. When it becomes 4x slower, it looks like this. Basically, the benefits are significant, especially when the latency multipliers increase, as you can see over here. So basically, as the slow memory becomes slower, the relative benefits compared to, uh, uh, let's say, the best prior mechanism actually uh, increase. So this is actually more general, let's say. But this doesn't take into account endurance. A lot of these works don't uh, assume that there's some other solution that's implemented for endurance, which is also interesting uh, to look at. Okay, I gave you the basic idea and some basic results, basically. But, but in general, this estimation of utility is really important, I think. Uh, people have uh, proposed this for caches. Uh, for example, if you're trying to decide uh, which application, assuming you're running multiple applications, and if you're trying to decide uh, which uh, cache block to replace from which application, you basically look at the utility, marginal utility that an application would gain uh, from caching one more block compared to the marginal utility another application would gain uh, from caching that block. And you, you pick the uh, block from the application that would gain more utility, like more performance by caching that block. So that's a general idea, uh, utility-based ma management of resources. And I think that's a step in the right direction. Of course, this requires estimation of utility. Okay, so I kind of discussed the challenge and opportunity, enabling an emerging technology to augment DM and managing hybrid memories. This is still ongoing work over here. There's another challenge, designing effective large uh, DM caches. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, this is interesting, and again, there's a lot of work in this area. I'm going to give you some early works uh, that we have done, but this was in 2010-11 timeframe. The publication is 2012, but there's 10 years of work after this also. Uh, which is interesting also. So here the issue is you have a huge cache. How do you design the uh, metadata store for it, which is the tax store? So again, assuming you're using uh, DRAM as a cache, it could be 512 gigabytes, right? So of course, good to ask the question, does it really make sense to use all of that as a cache? But that's a separate question. Let's assume that it's a cache. How do you design efficiently? So basically the key issue is you get a load you need to decide whether you should access DRAM or PCM. So if the metadata says X is in DRAM, access uh, X from DRAM, and then get the data. So this metadata is essentially a tax store, right? Like the tax store you've simulated your caches with, uh, but it's a huge tax store. Uh, you can do the calculations if you want. If it's 512 gigabytes and each uh, cache block is 64 bytes, you have a huge number of tags basically. So how do you actually, uh, keep these tags. You can have an SRAM structure over here in the memory controller, but that's very, very expensive. It's very huge, basically, 512 gigabytes divided by 64 bytes. That's eight, eight gigabytes, right? No, eight, eight gigabits, I guess. Well, depending on the size of your tag, of course, right? It, it could be eight gigabytes easily, basically. So you don't want that, <laughs> essentially. So our idea over here was to actually store the tags in the same row as data in DRAM. Uh, Basically, you're storing the metadata in the same row as their data. And this way, by doing one access to a row in DRAM, you can get the data and metadata. Essentially, you can get the cache blocks as well as the tags. And then you could do analysis on those tags, whether you match or not match. Now, this is nice, of course, because it eliminates the tag store and converts the tag store overhead to storage overhead in DRAM. So you lose some capacity in DRAM, clearly. Uh, and also, yeah, uh, this increases the latency, unfortunately, because now the DRAM cache is determined only after you access DRAM. Whether you hit in the data store of the DRAM is determined only after you access the DRAM and get the tag store and do the tag matching, right? So a cache requires two DRAM accesses. Even though the data is in one of these cache blocks, you need to do two DRAM accesses uh, to do the cache. It wants to get the tag and wants to get the cache block. 
The second idea is to overcome that, uh, which is uh, to cache the tags in SGEM. So instead of storing all the metadata in DM, well, you'll store all the metadata in DM still, but cache some of it in an on-chip SGEM. Now we're caching the tags, essentially, hopefully for frequently accessed metadata. And we, we show in this work that you can cache only a small amount of uh, tags to ca keep the DM SGEM size small. And the third idea is orthogonal uh, to both of these. It's basically trying to reduce the uh, data movement overhead between two memories. Uh, essentially, it's trying to, uh, it, it, it observes that some applications benefit from caching more data, larger granularity, they have because they have good spatial locality, but some applications do not. Large granularity wastes bandwidth and reduces cache utilization significantly. So the, uh, the paper introduced a simple dynamic caching granularity policy. I will not go into details, but again, this is a cost-benefit analysis-based model. What kind of, uh, what kind of granularity should I use to move data from one memory to another memory? That's the idea. So to be able to do this, we, have, we use some sampling. Uh, we group memory into different sets of rows and use different granularities. And uh, based on the sampling information, the rest of the main memory follows the best granularity. Again, I don't want to go into the detail, but you can sample uh, what granularity benefits what rows in memory and get an idea of what granularity is working well for this application. You can do this on a... Uh, uh, finer granularity also in terms of like memory regions. Uh, but this cost-benefit analysis uh, gives you an idea of what granularity to choose. And this can, you can change this every quantum. So there was some overhead of this is a time quantum. Periodically, you can change the granularity of data movement if some granularity becomes better to use. So there's some complication. You can see that they're, we're complicating the system, right? There's some complication that we're adding, but the benefits will be significant. So basically this is, uh, we call this timber. Uh, this this bar over here is assuming you have tags in SRAM, which is unreasonable. Like uh, now, uh, if you actually implement everything that we have discussed, you lose only six percent performance compared to assuming you have tags only in uh, in SRAM. Now, different uh, different parts of the proposal give different benefits, as you can see, but they all give significant benefits uh, over here. And then energy efficiency is actually much better than if you have tags in SRAM because we do this dynamic granularity management. So uh, if you actually manage this cache the way uh, described, your ener energy efficiency actually improves also. So you don't lose significant performance, but your energy efficiency improves compared to having an SRAM tag store that's unreasonable to implement in a memory controller. Again, as I said, this is early work. There's a lot of work that has happened after this that talks about this issue. There's also some earlier work before this also, but you can read the paper. So, the, uh, so some of this work is covered here in this table. Uh, basically, these are many different options for DM cache. What do you do on a DM cache hit? What do you do on a DM cache miss? How do you handle the replacement traffic? How do you handle the replacement decision? Who handles the replacement decision? Hardware, software? Can you handle large page caching, etc.? So there's a lot of interesting issues, uh, and there are a lot of papers. I'm not, uh, yeah, I will, I will skip this one also, but uh, there are a lot of interesting ideas. Any questions? Yes, please. Yeah, not necessarily exactly, but you can collect information as you run uh, the program, right? But basically, the uh, if I, I guess you're asking uh, related to this, right? How do you decide the granularity, right? Yeah, the analysis is essentially done based on the accesses that are done to memory. Whenever you access memory, uh, some part of memory follows some granularity, and based on that, you say, okay, I've done the. Uh, this is the performance I got, and basically, you collect information for different granularities as the program runs. And you pick the one that performs the best. That's correct, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. It's, yeah, it's based on the memory access patterns that you have done.
Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So now I'm, I will move on. Uh, we can discuss that offline also, if you have still doubts or questions, or you can ask the TAs. Uh, but let's talk about some other opportunities. Uh, so there's actually a lot of other interesting opportunities over here. I'm going to mention two, if you have time. Uh, you can merge memory and storage. If you have non-volatile memory, this opens up a whole new opportunity that didn't exist with DRAM. Uh, basically, you can do uh, persistent data allocation inside the non-volatile memory, and that could be part of your memory. It could also be part of your storage, or maybe you don't distinguish between them anymore. That's good to think about. Uh, and we're going to talk about that, hopefully. You can have new applications, potentially, and people have looked at ultra-fast checkpoint and restore, for example. That actually could be, could be useful. Actually, SSDs have enabled hibernation that's really fast in these devices, for example. Uh, if you have non-volatile memory, you can actually instantly almost do checkpointing and restore and not lose a lot of data if you have uh, errors, for example. People have looked at it from the perspective of high-performance computing. You can perhaps have more robust system design. We're going to, if you have time, we'll talk about that. But I'll talk about this first, processing tightly coupled with memory, uh, or processing using memory, essentially, uh, because you can do a lot over here that's a bit different from DRAM. So recall, we discussed processing using memory. We talked about in-memory block bitwise operations, and bits. Uh, I'm going to re uh, remind you. But in one of these slides, we said new memory technologies enable even more opportunities. I'm going to give you one example of the opportunities that these technologies enable. Uh, and these are the MBITs, SIMDRAM, et cetera, works. And these are, I guess, from the last year, but you can take a look at this year also. Uh, now, uh, the idea of row clone and MBITs, bitwise operations, people have actually done it also for non-volatile memory. If you look at this paper, they basically show that you could do uh, row copying uh, as well as uh, uh, bit bulk bitwise operations, just like MBIT does using non-volatile memory. You can read the paper for more detail. And they show good results, actually, on graph applications, for example. So this was written after the uh, MBIT and row clone works. Uh, but what, uh, so this is interesting, basically. You can do what you can do in DRAM in page change memory as well, as we were discussing earlier. But you can do even more uh, in, uh, in non-volatile memory technologies that you cannot do in DRAM. And that's uh, these array operations. So emerging memory technologies have cross-by array structure that's different from DRAM as we will see. A lot of these technologies have that, actually. And these crossbar arrays can be used to perform dot product operations, essentially matrix vector multiplication or vector vector multiplication uh, by using the analog computation capability present in these memories. Essentially, you can operate on multiple pieces of data using Kirchhoff's laws, and we will see that. Uh, the key idea is, to, uh, is bit line current, the current that you get on the bit line, is a sum of products of the word line voltage times the conductance of each cell, or one over cell resistance. And I'm going to show you uh, how this operates, actually. And computation is completely done in the analog domain inside the crossbar array. Of course, if you want to read uh, the data digitally, you need peripheral circuitry for analog to digital conversion and digital to analog con conversion for inputs and outputs. So let's take a look at this. So this is on, uh, over here on the right. You see a crossbar array. Uh, essentially, this is your non-volatile memory. Let's take a look at two bits in the same bit line over here. And these are word lines. So assume that this is a resistive memory cell. Uh, it has some resistance. Resistance is 1 over conductance, or conductance G is 1 over resistance. Think of it that way. And assume that we apply voltage 1 and voltage 2 concurrently to these two word lines. The result that we get on the bit line is essentially some of the currents that you get. So the current that you get over here is voltage one divided by resistance one, or voltage one times conductance one. And then uh, the current that you get from here is voltage two times conductance two. And the bit line current, the in the end over here, is the sum of those currents, because Kirchhoff's law says at a given node, you need to sum the currents that are uh, reaching that node, right? That's what we're doing over here. So. Uh, the current over here is the sum of the currents that are coming from both of these cells, uh, which is V1, G1, plus V2, G2. So now what we're doing is we're doing multiply and accumulate. We're multiplying uh, this voltage value with the conductance value and adding it to the multiplication of this voltage value with this conductance value. And if you keep adding more bits in the bit line, you will do the same thing for the different word lines for the different cells. That's the idea. And this is all in the analog domain, clearly, right? 
So you can basically have a vector matrix multiplier that looks like this. Here you have uh, voltages that are converted from digital to analog. And then you can store what your, the matrix, so the vector is the voltages over here on the word lines. The matrix is what's stored over here, assuming that you've written to it. It could be the weights of a neural network. It could be uh, some inputs to the neural network, uh, depending on how you do, this, do things. Uh, and then what you get out here is the bit line current uh, for, uh, or, or, the, or the dot product uh, of the vector uh, with the bits over here, essentially. So you get one bit over here, and then uh, the, the outcome of a vector matrix multiplication is the vector over here, essentially. So that's the idea. So I think I've already given you this, but this is an animation that shows essentially what I said. You multiply a four-bit vector with a four-by-four four matrix this way, and these are the results, essentially. Well, I mean, you can you can uh, extend this to I2, I3, I4 over here. Okay, I think this show essentially the same thing. <laughs> so basically the inputs can be the inputs, but these could be the weights for a neural network, for example. And people have actually developed a lot of prototypes to show that you could accelerate neural network inference uh, using this. I'm gonna mention some papers uh, toward the end. Actually, the paper that I mentioned over here does that. Let me go back. I'm not going to go into detail, but this is, for example, Isaac. It was published in 2016. It's a convolutional neural network accelerator using essentially what this, what I just discussed. So how do you do that? Uh, very quickly, uh, you need some peripheral circuitry for digital to analog conversion, and then you need to have some sampling and holding logic and analog to digital conversion. And if you need to do some manipulation uh, to these values, you need to have shifting and adding logic also. So analog domain is here, and then there's a digital domain over here. Of course, whenever you do analog computation, reliability is a problem, and there are some works that try to target the reliability, and there needs to be more work in that area over here. Let's take a look at what this could be used for. So uh, this is an example of two-dimensional convolution. Uh, here, uh, we look at the input. Input is blue. Uh, output is green. And you have a kernel that's gray. So you're, you're essentially applying the kernel or filter uh, to the input so that you can come up with the output. And the filter is basically a three by three filter applied to each cell in the input. Right? And that there's some computation that needs to be done uh, with that application and assume that it's a convolution computation. Right? So that's the idea over here. Uh, so how do you actually express this? You can actually express the kernel as the weights uh, inside the uh, uh, array and the input, you can feed the input uh, into the, uh, uh, into the array. So the kernel can be the uh, matrix and the input can be fed inside or the other way around. Input can be the matrix stored uh, and then you feed the kernel. Uh, that's, a, that's a possibility basically. So in this particular case, uh, we show that you're feeding the input, dividing the input. This is a three-dimensional input space. You're dividing the input, uh, let's say uh, piece by piece and feeding it into the uh, uh, analog uh, feeding into the non-volatile memory array. And non-volatile memory array has multiple kernels uh, that are stored, as you can see. So every input passes through multiple kernels to do some convolution operations. And then you get the results at the bit lines over here. So you collect the result as part of your output. That's the idea, basically. And again, this is a high-level overview, but uh, there's nothing magic in it. You can, you can do the calculations. I don't want to go into all of these calculations, but... So the key is basically sizing your array so that it can fit uh, the kernels over here and then sizing your chunks of input so that it's fed as vectors uh, to your array. Right? And again, uh, you can generalize this. So basically, this, uh, you can have non-volatile memory-based processing in memory, processing using memory. You can have some memory subarrays that just have memory, but then have some processing subarrays that operate like this. And then, but you, you, if you really want to accelerate a neural network, you cannot just do matrix vector multiplication, right? There are other stuff that you need to do. So there are some nonlinear functions like ReLU, et cetera. And then you may need to do some multiplication also for other purposes. So basically these chips have some additional, uh, let's say near memory processing uh, units to do some complex operations, but matrix vector multiplications are done in analog over here in many of the proposals. Okay. And there are a bunch of papers, even as early as 2015. Some of these are actually published in Nature. Uh, you can see that they talk about memristors and uh, operating a neuromor neuromorphic network, essentially matrix vector multiplication. Any thoughts? Yes. 
How do you change the weight? Basically, you need to write uh, a new weight over there. You need to rewrite it. You need to, you need to update uh, the, uh, the locations in non-volatile memory. If you want to load new weights, that's what you need to do. Yes, yes, exactly. You need to change the resistance value in the cells according to the weights. Essentially, it's a write operation, right? It's a, uh, so that's not matrix vector multiplication, but there needs to be some... Uh, so, okay, if you go back over here, it's very similar to a, a phase change memory-based write operation. Yeah, or STTMM. It's, this could be an STTMM cell also. You're basically writing to the cell a value. <laughs> Does that make sense? Exactly, it's an analog. Yeah, it needs to, it, yeah, exactly. So the difference is basically it needs to be analog. It needs to be some precise level, right? Because you're encoding the weights in analog domain right now. So there are a lot of, uh, basically, there are a lot of reliability issues that I overlooked over here. A lot of the, some of the papers overlook it, but this is an ongoing area of research where people are building a lot of prototype chips. They're, they're also discovering some of the reliability issues. But that's a very good point, basically. How do you, Encode the weights in analog domain. Yes, you need to be somewhat reliable. And I think usually, uh, even if you're not perfectly reliable, uh, there's, a one, there's one reason why these are used mainly for neural networks. They can tolerate some error rates. Yeah. But again, this is still ongoing research. There's a lot of ongoing research in this topic. Uh, like the, uh, the memory cells. I mean, certainly they are more expensive uh, than DRM today, but uh, I don't think they're, uh, basically the cost can reduce over time also. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So it's good to, I think, uh, think about these things. I think this is still uh, a little bit further into the future. Uh, in my opinion, Mbit uh, and Roclone are easier to implement clearly because they don't, uh, uh, they don't really operate fully in the analog domain, right? They operate in the analog domain, but they, they, they use a sense amplifiers in DRAM to amplify the signal. Here, you really need to have these analog to digital converses that don't normally exist uh, in the chips. And that's actually a major overhead in terms of cost also. So people are actually optimizing as much as possible. So I think there are, there are usually a bunch of proposals that try to build a better analog to digital converter or get rid of the analog to digital conversion if it's possible uh, and digital to analog conversion. But this is actually a tough area, I would say. Okay, so uh, I think we cover some of this in systolic arrays. If you've taken DDC, DDCA, essentially these convolutions, if you want to learn more about that, essentially it's systolic array computation that we're talking about. Okay, I don't think we have a whole lot of time. Two minutes. Let me give you the basic idea. <laughs> so the basic idea is this. Uh, memory and storage, these are today, today two very different things, right? You access memory directly using the programming language, you do loads and stores, you access storage using file, IO, file open, file close, etc. And this has evolved because these are two very different devices. Hard disks have been non-volatile, slow, block addressable. DRAM is volatile, fast, byte addressable. Now, an emerging memory technology like phase change memory kind of has characteristics of both, right? Almost as fast as DRAM, it's byte addressable actually, and it's non-volatile. Hard disks are block addressable because you need to actually seek a track. And then when you read from a track, you actually read a huge chunk and then bring it into, uh, basically you cannot read a single byte over there for many reasons. Error correction is one of the reasons actually. Uh, so it's evolved that way. And flash is also block addressable. Doesn't perfectly need to be in my opinion, but anyway, it's evolved from the hard disk. There's a lot of history also that has evolved the uh, technology. But here, non-volatile memory is very close to DRAM. And also it has characteristics of uh, storage. The key question is, does it really still make sense to have the dichotomy between memory and storage? And uh, this is a picture, as you can see. The traditional two-level storage model becomes a bottleneck. So here we use loads and stores to access main memory, which is a fast device. We go through a very, very sophisticated and hardware accelerated translation layers, virtual memory. And we store volatile data over here. And we access it via low stored interface that's heavily accelerated because this device is really fast. Traditionally, this device has been very slow, even, even if you assume flash over here. Uh, you have persistent data in the storage and if you access the file system interface. So you, ha you actually have a lot of software overhead over here to access. You cannot directly access the device. You need to go through many levels of protection in the file system. Now, if you replace this device with something like persistent or phase change memory, does it really still make sense 
to have this stuff. And this becomes a huge bottleneck. And the idea over here is why not have a unified memory and storage management unit uh, to eliminate all of the overheads. So if this is a really fast device, and this is a little bit faster device, it really doesn't make sense to actually take the data over here, move it over here to update it, and then move it back uh, from here to here. This is we're talking about persistent data. Like we're opening a file. When you open a file, what happens is that file gets opened and you go through a lot of system level code. It gets mapped to memory, main memory. You modify the file in DRAM or read the file in DRAM. And if you modify it, the modified parts get back, get written back uh, to the persistent memory. But if this is really fast, maybe it does not make sense. Maybe you should really access that fast device very quickly. Then the question becomes, how do you do that? So now we're out of time. So maybe I should not, uh, yeah. So maybe we should talk about how we do that briefly in the beginning of next lecture. And then we will continue with other stuff. Any burning questions? But I believe actually this is an opportunity that doesn't exist with DRAM. It's very, very difficult to make, uh, well, have a, have, have a non-volatile device over here. Now, if you have something closer to DRAM, this becomes extremely interesting. Even if it may not be, let's say, uh, as high capacity as DRAM potentially. So there could be something backed up by flash also, right? It could be phase change memory plus flash over here, if you think about it. Okay, I, I see no questions. So we should stop here. Have a nice weekend. Uh, I'll see you next week and we'll continue here.